What's going on, everybody? Um, this is Justin Bricker, and welcome to episode three of the Why Not Podcast. Uh, on today's episode, we have Raymond Roberson. Raymond Roberson is uh, an actor from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and man, we had a fucking blast. Uh, I've known Raymond since I was, um, shit, almost my entire life, from five years old. Um, Ray, Raymond was eight years older than me uh, and grew up um, up the street from me and was friends with my older brother. And um, as many of you know, um, my older brother passed away when I was 12 years old. And uh, Raymond did everything he could, you know, from then on out to make sure that I was okay, I was good. I had a positive role model to look up to and somebody to always be there for me if I needed him. And, um, you know, I've always been forever grateful for that. Um, on today's episode, though, we uh, we get together to uh, speak about um, really just doing everything it takes to uh, chase your dream and really, you know, put yourself out there in a position to where nothing else is an option but to chase your dream. And we talk about a few things along the way, um, such movies, comics, bullshit uh everything else man to this this was really a great conversation not only for um just to talk about you know like i said chasing your dreams but really for me to connect with somebody who uh has meant so much to me throughout my childhood and now becoming an adult and you know reconnecting and you know sharing these experiences and memories and um no i, th I really think you guys will enjoy it um a few other things I, I I would like to get out of the way. Um, I want to say thank you to everybody who has tuned in to the first two episodes. I've gotten some wonderful feedback, um, way more than I would ever ex I was ever expecting. You know, especially just starting out. Um, one thing I would ask is that you know if if you would everybody please uh, subscribe, subscribe, like, comment, rate, uh, especially on the iTunes Store. All it does is help the podcast and uh, doesn't take up too much of your time. Um, and if you could go ahead and follow me on social media, uh, everything, uh, at stack and bricks. Um, you can find me on Facebook as well. Justin Scott Pricker. Um, you can pretty much find me on everything just by searching that, but Instagram handle, Facebook, um, Twitter, all that shit. Fucking follow me, please. Um, but yeah, I'm, I don't want to take up uh, too much of the time as always. Um, and I'll have uh, links to raise social media and everything in the, the, the show notes as well. So, uh, once again, thank you guys for tuning again, uh, tuning in. And this is episode three of the Why Not Podcast. Be your own superhero. Let's do this. Uh, Raymond Robinson, sir, good to fucking see you, Good man. to see you stacking bricks, what's I'm, up? I'm not, man, I really appreciate you fucking taking the time out to do this with me, man. Like I said, I've just been trying to connect with, you know, people I know who are actually on a path to, you know, doing exactly what they want to do in their life. Yeah. You know, it might not be exactly right now, but at least you're trying to set that path for yourself to get there. Yeah. Um, and you, for as long as I've known you, you've always been that person who's always been doing everything that they can to do that. Right. As long as I can remember. I appreciate that. Okay. And... You know, I remember as a kid, you were the fucking first person I ever met that, like, made me realize it was cool to like comic books and shit like that. <laughs> like, I, I honestly, I owe that to you because, I mean, you were eight years older than me when I was a kid. And, you know, I looked up to you and my brother and, you know, the, you guys who were actually, you know, do you know, the yeah, cool kids, yeah. the cool kids, and, you know. It, it, it's, it's just, it's like a cool generational thing, man. It's like uh, some, some people grow up with it and then it's like the outcasts were the ones who end up taking over and they're the ones who did their homework and now everything's all about comic books and pop culture now and it's right. like and we're ahead of the curve right yeah. it's, and now all businesses are trying to make their stuff cater to that pop culture references and stuff it's like 90s babies are ruling the world like you watch a TV commercial and it references something references stuff like we grew up with and it's like holy crap like the guy who made this commercial must have been like 38 cause <laughs> yeah, right. like nobody, none of these young kids know who Urkel is and you know all that stuff and, right. or Boy Meets World and you see references like that you know plastered everywhere now it's like crap man. See, and, that's, and that's what I've been trying to do with, uh, with Kylie as well like you know, all this new shit that's out for kids these days is fucking it's, trash, it's, man. It is. It is trash. And it's like, I think it, it just wasn't 
edu- it's not educational. Well, it, not only is it not educational, most of it is borderline an acid trip. It, well, it, I mean, it is. It really is. Like like SpongeBob is nuts. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not the SpongeBob that we fucking grew it, up. It's on. nuts right now. Like Nickelodeon now is nuts. But back in the day, like there was some sort of like PSA, PSA announcement or something That's hidden it. in it. You know, yeah, it, it was entertaining. But at the end of the day, there was a moral to every story. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you watch a show like growing up. Pete and Pete. I know Pete, yeah, Pete and Pete was yeah, it. Pete, you know, Pete, Pete and Tamburelli. But, but, but yeah, yeah, that's what yeah, I'm talking yeah. about. But there was always like some sort of moral of family and just, you know, loving your tribe and all that stuff to it, right? Yeah. Like salute your shorts. There was a moral about just loving your tribe and stuff like that. Yeah. And I think a lot of shows nowadays are just like, it's more catered to... How long can we get you to sit in front of the TV? Yeah, it's more it's stimulation. It's not really, you know, education. It's stimulation. That's what a lot of entertainment is. Even like when you go on Instagram, it's all about 60 second... And then, right. <laughs> and, and, if, and if you notice, like um, a lot of the videos now that people put up, none of them are in real time. Either. No, no, or they're either sped up, and yeah, like, like those, like those musically videos, or yeah, like the dub smash, and and I was like, okay, are people really fucking watching this? It, people are, man. But and so I looked into it a little further, and apparently the way most kids or people with ADD, quote unquote ADD, how their brain registers that stuff is by the frame rate. Mm-hmm. And if so something's slowed down or like in normal time, it's just not that appealing to them. Right. I, I, I don't, whether it's subconscious or not, that I have no fucking idea. Well, like Vine, I was like, crap. Now it's like, you do entertainment in six seconds now or 10 seconds, like, ooh. Well, and that died, but it's, Instagram's giving you a minute now. Yeah. So it's still just mind blowing how entertainment has changed. You know, we can get things out faster, but the quality is not, there as much the quality and the content i would say in, in the overall content but yeah it's like obviously video music and editing quality is fucking is miles above than it's ever right, fucking right. been but what really drives me nuts is like we were saying is you know it's about how long they can keep your attention not right. about how good it is so like when you go to instagram right you go to the explore page it has like pictures of fucking booty models and right, some right. squats yeah and then in that one spot there's like videos you may like yeah you click on that and it plays one video, but your entire screen is black. Yes. Out. You can't see the time. You can't see nothing. It's like being in a casino. It's yeah. just you get lost in it. Yeah, because yeah. it's just, oh, 60 seconds, boop, 60 seconds. Boop, yeah. 60 seconds. It's absolutely nuts. Or this one's 12 seconds. Right. You know, and I, I, I feel like, okay, we can keep you here for two minutes. Let's now let's see how long we can keep you here. Yeah. You know? It is. It's, it's like casino tactics, man. It's like an episode of Black Mirror. You could just get lost into it. I actually recently just started. Uh, Listen to something where they're talking about how to start your morning off better. And a lot of successful people, the first thing they do is that they don't keep their phone right next to their pillow, which is something I've been doing way too long. Right, for 10 years. Because yeah, they're, right, they're like, that first hour when you wake up sets the tone for your complete day. And, oh, my court, hang on. There we go. My fault. And uh, it's like, so I even just did that today. I set my phone, like, across the bedroom. So when I, you know, and I woke up before the alarm. And I didn't check the time. I didn't do nothing. I was awake, so I just got ready. I hit the gym, and it turned out I got up like an hour earlier than I planned on getting up. Right. And, you know, I didn't even check the social media or nothing like that. I was able to get resumes sent out, sent out some info. I got all that done without checking my social media. And it's yeah. like, crap, my whole day is, like, set. Like, we could do this till right. I have to right. leave. Cause, right. And it, it just made a huge difference. So I think anybody listening is like, please do not. Do not check your social media first thing in the morning because that will we'll you that you will hole. be stuck in that all freaking that year whole momentum will be checking that page. Right. If you can wait, go at your first hour. If you can just put your phone on the dresser across the bed, set your alarm, get up, don't check the pages, do your morning routine, and then you know check stuff afterwards. Your whole day is going to be set more on you getting things done and not you right, feeling productive. and you not feeling like you're missing out on stuff and that's how they keep getting people coming back right because you, you know you, you, you start your day by accomplishing something yeah. and it just sets a tone yeah. if you start your day by laying there scrolling right. looking at, you're you know, not going to get up no, you are not you, going to get up you're not even worried about your life at this point right. you're so worried about what's on the other end of that phone and what other people are doing right. like you have to, you know, say you got to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. You got to be at work at five thirty. You got your phone. You got you're your staying phone, up till three fifteen. Like, right. I do not want to be up in an hour. I caught myself doing that last night. I got I got work because I still work the night gig, in between acting gigs, and it's like 
holy crap, I got home at 3, and then it was 3.20, and I was still just scrolling. I said, oh, nope, I got to set my yeah. phone across the bed, right? It's, 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 a, it's a trap. Yeah, I've been, I've, just, I've been trying to catch myself that lately. An iPhone, and I don't know if it's a new feature or not, but they have like a really good tool if you go into your settings. Mm -hmm. You can see how much time a day, a week, yes. a month you yes. spend on your, on your app. Yes, it's weekly for me, and I spent like seven hours screen time. I was like, crap. Yeah. But the week and but the week before that, I was actually down, and that's because I was like engaged in more stuff. So, it, I do like that because it really lets you know how many hours a week you're missing out on. I. One one thing I, I've tried to do lately is turning off notifications on my phone. Oh yeah, on, that helps. And, and hey, if, if it wasn't for my boy Adam Meredith, I wouldn't even uh, even uh, the idea that would have even crossed my mind. Right. But just even even ESPN. You know what I'm saying? Because I got it set up to uh, baseball, football, MMA, fucking yeah. boxing, all this shit. My phone's ding -ding 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 -ding, fucking 40 times a day. And, you know, it might be two seconds or five seconds of me reading that headline, but all of that fucking adds up throughout the day. And it's like, I've just wasted so much time yeah. literally doing nothing. Yeah. And man, I feel like that's a, a giant problem with our generation. And, and going back to kind of how you're talking about how, you know, we, we got in on comics and movies and video games and stuff like that growing up. Truth be told, a lot of the habits I have now were inspired by those stories and those comics. You know, a lot of our, you know, let's say somebody like, uh, what was a cool action? You know, there's X-Men or, or Superman or Captain America like, or Batman. That's, that's the number right. one thing a lot of people love. The thing about that character is that he was so smart and he was also, you know, very athletic and in shape. Right. And it seems like our generation is more in tune to athletics and, you know, mm -hmm. being in shape. And, you know, like you do the jujitsu and I love doing the boxing and stuff like that. I feel like because the entertainment we grew up with had characters that were so motivated that we wanted oh, yeah. to become motivated as well versus a lot of, you know, the Instagram -y entertainment where it's not really motivation. Like people say they're fitness models, but they're not posting any workouts or any no, like it's just they're not no right no <laughs> no diet plans no nothing. They're not posting any of yeah. that for anybody else. But they're you know they're just posting themselves. Versus right. you know when we read read the comic books and stuff like that, the characters had a code, they had an ethic, and you, and you that was inspiring as a kid. You're like man, when I grow up, I'm gonna be big and strong like that. Right. I I've, I've spent most of my childhood and adult life so far. Trying to be my own superhero. Yeah, my own movie, boom. You know? That's that's like, a perfect mentality. Man. That's that, that that's is perfect. what I have to do. You know, it's like yes. How can I not be the one to save the day for my own life? Yes, you thank know? you. That's what I'm talking about, man. So, and and really over the last you know five years, and and more of it's you know becoming an adult myself. But it's like I've just really tried to buckle down and do that. Like like I said, you know, as a kid, yeah, hell yeah, I wanted to be a fucking superhero. Right. But I didn't know what it took. Right. I didn't know how I had to go about it or how I could even do it in real life, mm -hmm. you know? And like I said, now I'm just trying to translate that into the adult world and figure out how I can do that for myself, for my daughter, for, you know, my, my teammates, everybody else around yeah. me. But, so let, let's, um, let's, let's kind of talk about, back, like you said, you, you know, you've been acting and doing all this stuff for a while now. You actually just got done shooting, was it a short film? A this, film? I, I got a, uh, there's a, uh, it's called Vincent's Vow. It's a, a faith-based indie film out there in Springfield that I was filming. I just did a week there, and now I gotta go back and do some reshoots on the fifteenth. Uh, the thing about acting is that you don't really get a lot of time prepared. Like stuff you want to do, it kind of comes up quick. Like you know, Vince's vow. The the audition I sent in my tape audition, probably the end of beginning of November, and then two weeks after that, they're like, "Hey, we want to offer you the part." It's uh, the character's name is Dequell. He's like the he's like a family man. And he's the best friend of the lead character, who is Vincent. And Vincent is this guy who kind of, he's got unresolved issues, and he tries to cope with that by, you know, messing around with the wrong type of women and getting himself into trouble. And I play his grounded friend that kind of just gives him advice and stuff like that. And it's cool, you know, playing a family man. You know, I'm not the guy. I'm a family guy, but I don't have kids of my own. Like, right. you got a daughter, and you're like an awesome father. So I, I, I really just kind of go off of it as my experience as a son. Right. And the things, you know, my pops did. And you had a pretty fucking good dad. You had a great dad, too. And that <laughs> yeah. makes a huge difference. You know what I'm saying? So I just basically went, okay, what did my dad do right that worked for me? And that's kind of how I use it for a character like that, right? Uh, and before the Vincent's Vow, uh, this act, actually, I did a lot of indie films this year. And I did one that took place in Michigan. I was in a week in Michigan and then a week out, I forgot what town, in Missouri. And that one was called Smile. I was actually the lead in that. And I play, wow. yeah, and I play a character who's a photographer, and 
ironically kind of talking about how we're talking about not being motivated. Like he's going through the motions in life and he sees, you know, his ex is getting married and he sees, you know, all these family secrets going about. If y'all hearing something, that's because there's construction outside my house. <laughs> so, you know, you know, Justin didn't just do a, a he didn't do an arm bar on me. It's just construction outside. <laughs> it's, not right the floor. it's not me hitting the floor. It's not me hitting the floor. We're not rolling. But, uh, no, uh, and it would just came at the right time because there was just oh, I was hitting that phase at the beginning of this year where I was like, okay, I'm, I got things in motion, but how do I take it a step further? Because as you know, when you get older, you just don't want to get too comfortable. Right. You want to make sure you're good. You want to make sure everybody you love is good. But I think, man, in, at our phase in life right now, our biggest fear is just being comfortable and being like, shit, five years have gone by and I haven't taken the ball any further. Right. C- c- confusing, you know, work with progress. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And that's another thing. Everybody's a lot busier now, but nobody's making progress. Everybody's right. spreading themselves so thin. Right. So, like, last year was a huge, huge year because that's when I got to do a lot of the commercial stuff that other people actually got to saw. Like, I've been acting for about, with an agent for about three or four years. And before that, you know, I did the little theater stuff, church stuff, kids stuff, you know what I'm saying, growing mm-hmm. up as a kid. Yeah. About, it wasn't until about three or four years ago, uh, my friend Chelsea, who uh, I used to go to high school with, she models and acts out in Vegas. She was like in Think Like a Man too. She was at the, yeah, she, like, she wow. like, hangs with Kevin Hart and stuff like that. And she, you know, she's doing it. Right. She, no, 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 no. <laughs> Chelsea, Chelsea, Chelsea. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. She's not like that. No, Chelsea's really cool. Chelsea's really cool. But uh, I, I made a comment to her about, man, you have done more films than me because Chelsea's really cool. Like, black, like this blind white girl. I was like, man, you've done more black movies than me. <laughs> <laughs> and she knew I always wanted to act as well. And, you know, she referred me to an agent out here in St. Louis. And then I went there and I met the agent and then they signed me. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, I actually got my first gig doing uh, something at Bud uh, Anheuser-Busch and Ozzy Smith was there. And that was like my first gig. I was just background extra. And then ever since then, every couple of months, you know, I would do like uh, uh, internal company videos and stuff like that, some voiceovers. And then last year, I went out to Kansas City, got an agent out there, and a month or two after that, that's where the Sprint commercial hit. I had my agent in Kansas City, she knows I live out here, and she was like, hey, uh, Sprint has a commercial audition, we want you to come out for it. And I was like, can I send a video? That's like, you can, but it will be better if you came here face to face and I knew right then and there it's like if I want this no bullshit I gotta get my ass in the car and go so it was a Monday I drove out there I did the audition drove back to St. Louis and worked my night shift I got off my night shift around 4 a.m. the agent's like hey uh, there's a call back actually so they want to see you guys again so I got off my night shift I came home slept like two hours drove back out to Kansas City I did the audition Uh, I did the second audition that was with uh Oh my God, I'm drawing a blank. I'm drawing a blank. Who I was in the commercial with, who's Autumn. Autumn's her name, and she was awesome. We had great chemistry. And just right off the bat, just having the chemistry, I was like, okay, we got this. I even like went to a clothing store, because they changed the script to being in a gym. Mm-hmm. And I knew the context of the whole script was about, you know, Sprint having better service than Verizon. So I went to the gym store in Kansas City, and I bought red and black Verizon colored themed clothes because I was selling the idea. I was right. selling their own idea back to them, right? right? So I came in like, you could put me on a set right the hell now, and I'm ready to do this. And they liked that a lot. So me and her, you know, we had a great audition together. And then uh, after driving back and forth between Kansas City and St. Louis for two days straight, I just got a room that night. Right. So I checked into the room after the audition. I was like, I'm not driving back to St. Louis. I checked into my room. As soon as I got in my room, my agent called. She says, please tell me you're still in Kansas City. I go, yeah. She goes, good, because you got the part, and you're going to be there in the morning. And I was like, all right, cool. It's so on. It's on, man. I went out there. I had some barbecue. I went back to my room. I woke up, went to the gym, and then I was on set at 8 a.m., and the script had changed again, but it was still at a gym. I'm telling you, like, I don't remember my lines until the day, like, the, 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 like the day of, just right. for the fact that so much changes. So I just try to remember, like, the context of, who my character is and what's about to happen. You know, I don't get so stuck up on the words because they'll change that like in, in, a an instant, in a heartbeat for right. you. And a lot of people, a lot of actors throw themselves off because they're so more worried about being perfect for the words but not understanding what's happening. Well, so. and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I, I feel what makes a, a great actor isn't 
the words. Not at all. It's, it's you being able to act the character. Not at all. Now, and, if, and if you can take those, those, you know, that character and put it in your own words. Right. Like, right. So the, the words shouldn't matter if you know the context of the character. Without a doubt. Like, if you watch anything I do, a lot of the times I, I, I ask the people around, like, can I word this a little differently? Because right. when, because writers and, you know, actors, they don't really right, speak yeah, this sentence. They're not creators. Right. Yeah. Writers are pretty much setting the tone for the story. Like, this is what this means. This is what that means. Right. This is why that's happening. But then actors have to bring that to life in their own way. You know, nobody, you know, when you, I mean, if you read a Kevin Hart script, none of those words sound like Kevin Hart until he comes right. in and he does it his way. But we did the, uh, we did the sprint commercial. I was on a treadmill for nine hours. And I didn't want to waste any more sick days. How many steps to get in? Oh, dude, man, I was chafing so bad the next day. <laughs> like it was, it was rough, man. It was rough. I was on that treadmill for nine hours. Then I drove back to St. Louis after we filmed. Uh, we were down by five. I drove back to St. Louis and worked my night shift. So that was like a twenty-hour day. But nobody could tell me shit. Hell nobody no. could tell me Hell shit. No. I came back and I had my head, head, head held up. I was like, I'm doing what I love to do. And I was just so amped. I, wanna, I couldn't have fallen asleep if I wanted to. Right. But I didn't really tell anybody at work because I was like, it may not go through. You know what I'm saying? Right. You, you don't want to tell people I did this and then they cut you out of it. Yeah. And then one freaking day, right before the Super Bowl, I'm like, holy shit. That's me on TV. And then I had phone was blowing up and all that stuff. I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life. Because it was a national, it was a national, it was a commercial. national commercial. Like, so, so how, how, how does, how does that work? Like, do they run it for a certain period of time? They ran it. It was a promotional commercial. So they ran it for like two or three weeks. Two or three weeks. And you know, that was a union job. And, uh, I haven't joined the actors union yet. Just for the fact that, you know, like if I book one more union gig, then I'm going to be have to join. And that's fine. I don't mind the actors union at all. Just right now, I have the options of doing non-union and union. Right. You know what I'm saying? And in the Midwest, it's kind of good to be in the middle right now until you have to join. Right, because um, how much really feature union work is there? Exactly, out? exactly. Like the indie film I'm doing, it's paid. It's a non-union project, but it's still something I want to do and something that I feel proud to be part of, right? But, uh, yeah, so it basically they aired that for like two or three weeks, and they aired it like every hour, man. That thing, it was like ridiculous. It got to a point where my buddy Rashad was sending me Snapchats like, get the hell off my TV. And it's, it's like, it's, it's, you're more aware of it when you know the people. Right. I mean, you don't know people in commercials. It's just, faces, it on just TV. faces on TV. You're not paying attention. But right. like, a lot of people are like, they heard my voice, and they're like, oh, shit, that's right. So that was fun. That was fun for me because that wasn't, that wasn't like a like a bragging moment but that was more of like a I'm doing what I said I would always yeah. do like when you tell somebody I'm yeah. going to be this when I grow up you, you, you feel more obligated to follow through on that right. versus a lot of people who don't have the courage to say what they really want to be right. like if you ask people what they want to be when they grow up that's such a painful question for them you can see in their eyes because yeah. a lot of them haven't been that you know what I'm saying so when you when you say this is what I want to be, you're pretty much setting things in motion for you to follow through. Otherwise, you're just gonna be like, if I don't follow through, I'm just I'm lying to myself and I'm full of shit, you yeah. know. And you don't want that, right? Hell so yeah. when that so when that happened, I was I, like a lot was lifted off my chest, man. But I had to follow through because yeah. after, after it came out, I was like, okay, that's old news now. What's new? Right, so, that first real sense of right, no, right, right, right. So now it's, that's that's kind of how the thing was. It was like after that, I was like, okay, now now where can I go? Now where can I go? Right. Otherwise, you know, you can't. You don't want to be a one hit wonder. Like I ran a treadmill, and that was my highlight. I did one sprint. <laughs> I, did, I did one sprint, and you know, you get that in St. Louis. Guy drops one hit, you know, and mm -hmm. then he falls off because he. You know, kept banking off. Ride that right, he, and I'm not trying to ride waves. I'm trying to just control the whole ocean, man. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So after that, then was the AMC ad. If you go to an AMC theater, I'm in front of like their pre roll, like mm -hmm. before the movie start. I'm at the bar having drinks, and that was a cool day too because the guy wasn't a bartender, so he goes to make a drink, and he spills it all on himself right now. And then after the AMC thing, uh, what else did I do? I did became a spokesman for a family. Was a family service, family support division in mm -hmm. Missouri. I'm the spokesperson for there. So if anybody goes on that website, I'm actually doing a lot of videos, talking people through stuff. And I like that because I like doing stuff that actually helps people get mm -hmm. informed and help themselves out. But no, that was last year was such a great year. And this year I kind of mellowed out. I said, OK, I've, I've ter technically I've done what I said I was going to do. So now I have to be more strategic and take it to a level I want to do next. What's next for me? I said, I want to do more narrative stuff. So 
I didn't do as much commercial stuff this year because I wanted to pursue more storytelling this year. So I, you know, I got the two indie films and I did a really fun short film that actually was more physical and action and stuff like that. Uh, the effects guy, I don't know if you've seen a horror movie, You're Next. Mm-hmm. There's a horror movie called You're Next. It was actually filmed in Columbia, Missouri. The guys who did the blood, gore, and effects for that. It's actually a cool movie. You should check it out. They, they actually worked on that short film I did. And my character deals a lot with knives and stuff. And there's actually a cool scene where I get to, like, ram a knife in a guy's face. And that was, like, the most... I've never filmed anything that violent before, but it was hella fun. So like a warrior. Yes, like yes. It was kind of like a... It was like a book of Eli short film kind of tribute, stuff like that. And I actually saw the ending footage for it, like, two days ago. I said, dude, you got to finish this crap. And I have it... Just have it ready for me so I can send that out. So. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's how it rolls, man. So what, what short film? What 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 classifies it as a sh- like a short film? Short how- film. Now, short films are actually a lot easier to write. You know, I think anybody who wants to get into film or acting, short films are the best way to go because they pretty much just start in the thick of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You have a character, and where that character, any good story, <clears throat> any good story, the character should end on the opposite of where they began. So you know, if you got a, if you got a guy who hates kids. That by the end of that short film or any full length movie, he should love kids. Right. You know, that's a sign of a good story. Otherwise, you know, if nobody makes change and nothing happens, like that movie, that story is pointless. Yeah, what the fuck? Right, exactly. <laughs> like, what the hell was this? Like, if you look at a lot of bad movies you watch, they actually have that same flaw. Mm-hmm. And if you look at a lot of good movies you watch, they actually have that character change and whatnot. Uh, a short film can be anywhere from under, you know, 30 minutes, anything under an hour. I mean, Ideally, if you want to get into festivals, the shorter the better, because they want to fit as many films into the time slate. So if you can make a good short film that's less than 14 minutes, that's gonna, you're more likely going to be in there. But if you make a 30-minute short film, they're going to be like, okay, that's cool and all, but then there's three other films we won't be able to show because your time slate's so big. So if you can get a short film down to 13, 10, 13 minutes, you know, 13 max, you'll be good. You'll be good. You could get it down to five minutes, and you'll definitely be able to get play anywhere, you know? So... <clears throat> and, and, and the last one you did here in Springfield, how, how long of a movie was that? It's 112 pages. Uh, typically, any a page equals a minute. But also, you do have to add on, you know, edits, the tracking yeah. shots, edits. So it might be five or ten minutes longer, or five or ten minutes shorter. Okay. So it's a full, it's a full length. You know? Right. I was gonna say. So this is this your full like uh, full length. Uh, movie that this one, yeah, but also the one I did uh, in January, February up in Michigan called Smile. That when I was leading, that one is going to be about ninety minutes or so. Okay. And that one, that I've seen some footage of that, and that was beautiful. We went and we sledded on like Lake Michigan and stuff like that because the character, the whole story takes place in uh, Holland, Michigan, which is where the director grew up, mm-hmm. Dan Stepman, awesome guy. He does a lot of cool indie films out here in Missouri, and. Uh, yeah, we went up there in the winter, sledded by Lake Michigan, all that had a blast. So it's a lot of great footage, and I can't wait to see that one when it's done. So when's, and when is that supposed to release? Do you know? You never know. Yeah. I have I have no idea. He's taking his time, and like I said, I just did some voice like uh, ADR, like mm-hmm. reset some lines and stuff, and I'm seeing the footage. So it's being worked on, and it's good. And I'm glad it's not being rushed. I think that's the thing with independent films is that it's a lot of passion projects for people, so they want to take their time to make sure it's done right. And I'm, pre- I'm glad he's taking his time for it as well, because if he kind of just rushed it out in like a month, I'd be like, man, you missed a lot. So I think by the time it comes out, hopefully, what we filmed, we start filming in February, hopefully by next March, like next, you know. Like this upcoming March 2019. Yeah, something like that. You know, that'd be great. That, it'll definitely be done by next year. It'll definitely be done by next year. Also, it does take place during the winter, so maybe he might save it and just get it composed and have it ready for next winter. But Dropping, okay. Yeah, but it, yeah, oh, that's going to be next year. So a lot of work was done this year, so next year, hopefully, all the stuff I get is put out. Yeah, and, and I guess you see that probably a lot in, in the entertainment industry. I mean, shit you see with, with music, you know, guys yeah. re, you know, release an album every two years. Yeah. But they've been working on it and writing right. songs for a year, right. and then the rest is spent mixing knocking off the shit that they don't right. want to be on there. So, right. Yeah, I, I mean... The, the quickest turnaround stuff is obviously commercial work, man. It right. is. Like, like uh, what was it? I just did something for Amazon. I just did something for... Uh, who was it? Who was it? Hallmark, whatever it was. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, what was it? I'm trying to think now because my buddy just sent me a picture of it. Express Scripts. Uh, Express Scripts on her Facebook page. Uh, I played a military guy. And that, the turnaround for commercial work is fast. Like, the Sprint stuff, the AMC stuff, you 
basically get the audition a week before, and then the next week they're filming it, back and then they're <laughs> editing it because they they got hit those deadlines for the promotions and to get right. the customers is like you know sell sell sell. So I guess, I they, guess getting those TV slots out. Right, they're getting those they're getting those slots out, so that stuff turns around quick. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Uh, but film like they take a lot of times, and you hear so many delays now and. All kinds of movies. They set they set a goal. They set we're gonna have this release by here, but that's more so they can get things in motion and get it done. Right. Now, if they if not if not up to par, then they will push it back a lot of time. And a lot of good movies do. They kind of they they right. really don't hit their deadline. Right. And I'm cool with a movie taking more time. You'll see a big movie promotion going. I mean, a big preview in the theaters, and it's like, oh, summer 2018, and it's like, right, oh, right, motherfucker didn't come out until August 29th. Right, <laughs> right, right, and it wasn't worth it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and like you see that with the superhero movies, like. I love DC character, but man, the DC universe is kind of jacked right now, man. It's just, you, you feel like everything was rushed. And, 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 and that's, that's and what I want to say. And, and that's the worst thing you could do for paying customers, a.k.a. fans. It's yeah. like, when you're sitting in that theater, you didn't feel like a movie was made for you. You felt like a movie was made for them to get profit. And that was right. just... And on top of that, it's just like, I'm not even feeling this right now. Like, yeah. I'm not seeing the characters. I'm seeing the actors that rushed to get this shit done for right. you guys, and then y'all hacked it up. And it it could have, yeah, it should have been way more better. I think they're going to be on track. They say Aquaman's good, but if you're making anything, make it so you're proud of it. Don't right. make it so that you can just say you made it or so you get profit off it. Make stuff you're proud of, and then all the other stuff will follow, man. Absolutely. And, see, and you know, go back to like what you were saying with you know the the DC universe. I, like, you could tell that they like it was Suicide Squad. Yes. Like, like how first, long, first I, and foremost, like where did that come from? Yeah. You, you saw like wow, Suicide Squad movie. Okay, I'm on it. But yeah, what that? <laughs> like, we, we don't have any introduction to any of these characters. Right. In, unless you were diehard in, in exactly, the universe. exactly. You and know, like, even then, you were still like, oh, you, those people who were diehard just picked it apart. Yeah. Exactly. And you know what though? I felt the first forty-five minutes of the movie was incredible. I'm with you on that. Was I am. I am with you on that. I think those forty-five minutes were untouched, but then the rest of the movie, you're like, "What the fuck?" Like now we have kicking wing from Joe Dirt showing up for about thirty-five seconds, and he's gone. Like, just well, I think. Well, no, the big rumor about that was that Batman vs Superman got so much flack that they just did reshoots to make it more accessible. And that's another thing, man. It's kind of like. Stick to your guns, you know, you can't, it's really hard changing course in the yeah. middle, you know, they were, they were filming and then they wanted to change course and they brought people back for reshoots and it's like, if you're doing something to add to the story, cool, but if you're doing something to kind of just like try to change the tone, you know, mid, it's like, oh my God. It, it, does, it doesn't work for anybody. It, it doesn't, it really doesn't and it shows, like, it's, it's uneven. Well, and, and, you know, and I'd like you to speak on this from you know an actor standpoint. So, say you do get called in for some reshoots like this. Right. It's like one, you weren't you weren't planning something like this. Right. Okay. Yeah, you might plan for having to shoot reshoots and you know do some other voiceover stuff or reworks right. and things. But it's like now you're bringing me back in to change an entire scene, and I'm not even in the same mindset I was when I when I was preparing for this That's role. A really good question. Like like you see guys like Jared Leto or you know even yeah. Heath Ledger. He got screwed on that movie, by the way. I, it, it's fucking terrible. I, and people are ripping into Leto for his Joker, but I feel like if you just took all his Joker footage and played it, people would have loved it. Yeah, I, I do. I feel like that guy got screwed. Well, right? and 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 that's what they did to sell the movie. Yeah, yeah, they sold the shit out of the movie yeah. with Leto, and then they didn't have him in it because maybe he was. Because gotcha. I don't think maybe he was hardcore, and then they're like, "Oh, everybody's complaining about it being dark." But I'm like, "They're the villains. It can be dark. It has to. Be. It ha- the villains it has can to be, be dark. Be. Yeah. It's like that's how you know, like you guys aren't listening. Like yeah. the villains can be dark. You just Superman shouldn't be frowning, and you know he can. He can. Superman can. And this is how I always envision making a Superman movie. Superman can be a good guy, like you know in the comics, but he just has to face real world issues mm-hmm. that's how you make a dramatic superman movie right you know what i'm saying superman going up against real crime superman going against world hunger and stuff like that that's dramatic right trying to make superman very very sad and you know ooh, I, you know i hate An saying ang- that yeah that just doesn't this, work this burden has been you know what i'm saying yeah. you know what i'm saying it just doesn't work like have him deal with real issues and people will respect him more that's why i think people love batman because as ridiculous as a guy in a giant bat suit is uh, you know, he takes on the criminals and stuff like that that you kind of see in your modern society. Like, that character is on point when he is on the streets taking out the scum that strikes fear in innocent people. Like, that's when you love that character. That's what the Daredevil show does so well. Right. Like, when he's got, when he's bloodied up, 
walking down the hallway taking out you know the type of crooks you see every day that's when you're really amped and on his side but it's just like yeah it's man <laughs> you're just like man how do you guys mess this up like you could even just take an animated film and remake it and it could have been banked have you seen Killing the Joke yeah if they would have just made that live action yeah that would have been better even though that got some hate it still would have been better well I think you had to hate because you had the sex scene with a 50 Bat- year old Batman yeah and- Batgirl and yeah, they all of a sudden he's that. on the roof and dropping trial. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember my friends going, I can't even watch Batman with my kids. He's yeah. gra- Batman's grabbing ass now. And it's like, crushing, but honestly, crushing like, cheeks on a roof. Oh, man. But even then, man, you know, all those superheroes, they're on shape and they're in tights. You know, that stuff happens behind, you got you. You got <laughs> behind you. in the back. But still, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I think because it went nowhere really after that, that's where it just felt very, you know, like, what, what, right. What and plus, Batgirl is kind of like she's a she's a positive figure for girls. Like she's her own woman, so to kind of have her just be Batman's side piece and all that was degrading to her. And I understand people Absolutely. going, and I understand people going like that's Wayne. You know what I'm saying? You know him if that was him a Catwoman because that's his boo. That's who he that married. Would, that would make that total sense. Since a Catwoman is kind of a dom, you know, she's kind of a. Uh, dominant figure. It, it she, would be her being like, "Hey, we're on this rooftop. Drop your fucking pants." Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Catwoman, she's her own person. She was taking control, but yeah. Batgirl, it, yeah, it, it was kind of a bad. Vibe it it right. was. It was almost like I'm your boss and you're my secretary. Yeah, and it now was I'm about to get down. On and top people of this and people honestly had the right to feel uncomfortable about that because yeah. she was still coming to her own. You know what right. I'm saying? And he's like a 50 year old man. She's barely old enough to be. But he's Batman, right? So it's okay. <laughs> right? It was weird. It was weird. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, so but, but so back 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 to the reshoot thing, you know, like when we were talking with Suicide Squad, um, you know, go, like I said, going in going into that, you know, shooting this, you have one mentality, and then they bring you back to change everything that you worked so fucking hard on. So it's like I feel like not only are they not into reshooting it mm-hmm. now, it's like you've almost disrespected my work. And no, I don't, I don't like the reshoots I've had to do for Smile, and the, I feel like they actually added to it because I'm like, oh. This makes more sense because this explains it better. Uh, for me, doing a character, it's not a matter of, you know, I, for me, acting is a team sport. It's not, oh, I want to make myself cry so the audience can cry. That's not how it works at all. Right. What you got to do is, hey, I want to relate to this because other people have been through this, and that's how I can kind of get into a character. Uh, it's like more of a service, man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I think, of, I, think of a scene, like, I think of a scene that makes me cry or scenes that choke me up. It's a lot of those scenes of self-sacrifice, like Gladiator. That scene always gets me. Russell Crowe at the end of that yeah. movie, he makes this huge sacrifice, and the first thing he says is, set my men free. And that gets me, man. You yeah. know, Because you hear about those people out there in the world who made our country, who sacrificed you know, during civil rights, during wars, all that. Like, you know people out there exist. For the greater good. Exactly. You know people out there exist where they're bleeding, and the first thing they say is, let those people be free like oh man it cra- it breaks me so to get in the character i just think of it's empathy you know what i'm saying it's not ego it has to be empathy it's like you just have to relate to what they're going through no you know real stories of how that happened and then you get back into place and luckily smile is more of a dramedy so it is some comedy and drama mixed in and it's a real character you know real type of person so right. it's easy for me to get into that plus you know, the director shows me just because of who I am. So I got to do it my way, but also be empathetic toward how this situation works in the real world. So, right, right, right. Because nobody plans to have a bad day, but it happens and you exactly. go through the emotions. Yeah, so, you never wake up saying, I'm going to be sad. Hope, to, right, I, right. I, I think I'm going to be sad today. Right. So I don't really freak out too much if I, a scene drops in front of me. It's like, hey, tomorrow you got to deal with this. And it's like, that's how the real world happens. Things drop in your lap and you just got to deal with it. So. Nice, nice, nice. So, and, 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 and tell me one more again what, uh, what's, what the, the background of Smile is. Smile, the background of Smile is I play a 35-year-old photographer. He's kind of he's going through the motions in life. You know, he has a nice little small photography business, and his ex-girlfriend is just about to get married. Right, okay, okay. And, you know, he finds out some dark family secrets. Like some, and uh, he's, just, he's just stuck in a rut in life. He is. Uh, and he meets a girl named Priya, you know, she is just this fun loving girl who just kind of challenges everything he knows about life because she's actually, she was in an accident, so she's in a wheelchair and stuff like that. And I know that sounds like cheesy Oscar, but like, oh, girl in a wheelchair, but no, she's not that kind of character at all. Like, right. she's really funny. And like, honestly, she's a sting stealer. Uh, and he just starts hanging with her, even though he's missing and longing for his ex. But, you know, 
just his friends and Priya, they're kind of just pulling him out of it. And it's definitely a movie just about people realizing they need to move forward. It's, it's a redemption it, story. Yeah, and it's, it's definitely, it's definitely fits the theme of this year for me of just taking everything I got and moving forward. Because the character I got, he, he owns a, a photography shop, but he really wants to do real photography, like art galleries and shows right. like that. So he kind of settled, but he, he still has ambition. And I like the story because that's such a real thing. People, mm-hmm. don't, people are afraid to go all the way, so they'll be like, they'll put their toe well, I, in. But I, I got here. Right, I, I got, got here, here. And, they'll, and they'll settle there. But right. it's like, no, you didn't go all the way, man. Right. And if you don't go all the way, none of your relationships right. are going to work out. On the ground. Right, and that's what his issue was. He, he never really gone all the way, so his relationships fell apart. He kind of just felt disconnected. And if you're not, until you go all the way and try something you really want to try, you'll be no good to anyone because you're just going to self-hate yourself but take it out on other people. Right. And, and so it's, I'm really excited for Smile. So, yeah. so for a role like this, it, it, it wasn't too hard for you to prepare it, mentally. It, was, was it, it? wasn't because ironically, a lot of things that freaking came up when the director hit me, it was just stuff I got done going through. Like, you know, somebody I was, but she was getting married again. And I wasn't like down and depressed about that, but it was just one of those passing of time moments. Yeah. You know, and also I was in a place where I was ready to pursue the things I wanted to do in my life and, you know, not, you know, play around with, like, I really want to get into this. So a lot of the things my character went through, you know, they're definitely a lot bigger and dramatic. I was going through myself in the real life. Of course, I, I was a little bit more focused in knowing what I wanted to do to get out of it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I use this pro- pro- this project sort of as a stepping stone into more of the things I wanted to do. And I think the best way to get through something is to just have a, a project to work on. Yeah. You got you to keep your mind busy. Yeah, you, you know, do. You do. You have to learn to keep your mind busy, but also you have to sort of set a deadline for yourself as well. Right. And, and you know, I think, you know, like you said, you, you, to get yourself out of that or to be happy, you have to have things to work on. Yeah. Like, you know, people talk about we, uh, the depression rates in this country or in this world are fucking higher than they've ever been. And it's because nobody has to do anything anymore. Yeah, you know, and I, for me, man, I think it's... it's it's that fear of missing out. That's what they call it, F-O-M-O. Yeah. And, and social media, as much as I love it, because it helps me connect with people and kind of you know, share jokes with my friends and stuff like that. You know, we stay connected yeah, on it, absolutely. even though we're busy. It's just, I think it goes into people just starting their day, feeling like they're not doing anything with their life. Or they're not on par with the other people that are on the other side of that screen when you're only seeing snapshots of their best moments and not yeah. what else they have yeah, to do. Yeah, even through. even even the stuff I post sometimes I'll be happy on set, but I'm also very conscious of where I post cuz I want people mm-hmm. to feel like that it's every, glamorous. Yeah, yeah, it, it's not always glamorous. Like I said, dude, like it's a, it was a short <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. Like that was a small it's a small indie film I'm doing and I love it and it's great and it pays a little bit, but they had me stay in this house that was cool, but at the same time it was an old house. So like the third night I hear and I'm like, what the heck is that? And then, like, I wake up and a freaking mouse dashes across the floor. I'm like, this crap is not all glamorous, man. Right, this right. crap is not all glamorous. Like, it's, it's, you, you, it's, it's, you know, it's everybody doing the best they can to make something great. And I'm cool with that. And, you know, I didn't run out the house. They laid down some mouse traps and I'm moving to another room. Right, right, right. And I'm you know, moving to the next room and I stayed there because, you know, I'm not a diva. And at the same time, like, this is the best they have. And I'm yeah. going gonna, I'm, I'm to accept it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and still do my best work, and I just was like, well, maybe my character has a house with mouse, so I'm just gonna use that. You know, right. everything that happens, you know, just try to use it. You know, see the opportunity in it, in the fuel. Find a way and see how you can do exactly, it. Exactly, exactly, man. Yeah. So, what what is a a typical day on set like? A typical day on set. All right, first you wake up, <laughs> then then you eat a lot of the craft services. Uh, if you've ever on been on set, I just want you to notice. If they lay it out for people to eat, it's not stealing if you take it home. Hell no. Hell no. It's no, not. Because it was, it was meant to be eaten, damn take, it. Take all those Pop-Tarts. Take all those bottled waters, man. The, Trust the, mo- the money was already the spent. The money was it. already spent. It's better for it to be used and gone away. So I, I take a crap ton of uh, uh, eat granola bar, bars. If there's like a gym nearby, I try to work out there and just get my mind set and ready. Then uh, you have a call time. Your call time is usually an hour or an hour and a half before you actually start rolling so you get there anything that needs to be going over like script changes something like that you work that over uh you go meet wardrobe you get your outfit picked out for the scene uh you just know what scenes you're going to do at the location and whatnot and usually that's when i start going over the dialogue and stuff i don't like to over rehearse i i do rehearse because that you know that helps other people get in the zone but i don't like to over rehearse because i don't want to 
just say something out and, of and I, not be able to react exactly i don't right. want to say something just to be like robotic like i've said this a million times before blah 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 and you see people phoning in too like is the camera picks up everything the camera yeah. could look in your eyes and be like this dude's yeah. not in it he's you know what i'm saying so i don't over rehearse it and i pretty much in terms of uh learning the script i only learn the scenes of what my character is engaged in uh, if I want to know if something's good or not, I'll talk to somebody else who's in the project and see if they read the whole script. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, this is pretty cool. This is the outline. You should definitely do this, and I'll do it. Because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to bring knowledge that I'm not supposed to have into a scene. Like if, my, like if I got a best friend who's a drug dealer and my character does not know he's a drug dealer, I, I don't want to I don't want to reflect that in the scene. Uh, so if okay, I read the yeah, whole yeah, yeah. so if I read the whole script and in my mind I'm going oh I know he's a drug dealer. So. Well now I have to act surprised <laughs> when I find out. Yeah yeah, yeah okay. exactly exactly you know that's kind of I think how some TV actors do it because every other week they don't know what's going to happen next. But I don't want to know so much that it affects my performance in the moment. You know if I'm supposed to be ignorant to something you know. So then we do a couple rehearsals, get blocking done, and blocking is when. They mark where you're supposed to walk and stand, and stand so that the lighting and the camera, all that's in the right kind of focus. And that takes forever. Most, I was going to say, how many times do you have to run through that I mean, before you can even start reciting I mean, your lines? I mean, honestly, dude, the, the blocking and the lighting, that takes most of the time on the set. Like, I wish I could say there was a lot of acting going on, but most of it... It's a lot of standing and waiting. Most of it is standing and waiting, and, and, but the crew was phenomenal. Like, uh, the sound guy, Kong, I actually worked with him before. And the thing is, when he stays mic'd up, he can hear everything you say. So I talk all kinds of shit to Kong. When, like, nobody else can hear, but I'll just be in my mic, just going, like, talking, going ham. Hey, and he just be over there with his boom mic, just cracking up. Kong is, like, this big, friendly, like, Buddha-looking guy. I love him to death. And he'll just be over there going, like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and they get that set up, and then they say action, and then you go. And, like, you know, I don't try to get, you know, I try to do perfect wording on the first take. I always try to give the director that perfect word, perfect, and then as we keep going, I go, okay, you mind if I try it this way, try it that way? So, like, you know, after you go through a couple of times, it gets more natural, and then people settle in, they get more comfortable with each other, and then by that, for me, in my opinion, by like that fifth or sixth take, that's when people start to come out of their shell, and they're like, okay, right. I did what I was supposed to do. Did Not, your warm-up sets. You did your, exactly, they're warm-up sets. That's how I feel the first couple of takes, they're warm-up sets. That's actually the best way that ever I've heard it put. And then, like, you're like, I got this now. Like, I know what the rhythm is, and I know how you're going to throw at me, but I'm going to throw you a curveball, this thing, stuff like that. And it was great. Like, uh, we, me, and my, me and the character, Dequel and Vince, they're, like, really tight. You know, they grew up with each other, like, you, you and me, right? right? And I want, and uh, he's, he, the director who wrote it also, the actor who wrote it, he was like, yeah, I really want to convey that these two guys are brothers, you know, despite their differences, despite the quell having been a family man, being black, and Vince kind of being uh, a knucklehead and white and all that stuff. And he had this whole dialogue written where it was just like, you know, I, I look him in the eye, I give him brotherly advice, and then we just do a handshake and we walk away. But by like the fit, but after he just told me that, I was like, you didn't write it this way, but I'm going to play it my way and I'm going to throw your curveball, but it's going to be the most natural, real thing right. that happens in the real world. So we did the same. And at the end of the scene, after we did the handshake, I hit him upside the head and I say, be good. I love you. Yeah. Hell yeah. And that's, and that's, that's, that's a real, and that's a real fucking friend. That's a real yeah. friend. Like he's not going to, you know, he's not going to sugarcoat it. Yeah. He's going to slap you upside the head. Be hey, good. I, I love fucking you. know you. Keep exactly, and, and that, and that, and that, and then after that take, he was like, "That was it, right there." Yeah. Like, because real friends, they will hit you upside your head and be like, "Okay, numb nuts, I love you, yeah. be good." Like, right. that's how friends talk right. to each other. I know other. what the fuck is going on. Right, in your head exactly, right now. exactly. It's not like, "Hey, you can do this, buddy. You got." This. It's not like that at right. all. It is that, and because that person's not your friend. Right, exactly, that exactly. exactly. That person is not your friend. And after that take, he was like, "That was it," and I was like, I, ah. and it felt so good. Like, it felt good bringing real life to that. So yeah, yeah, hell yeah. So, and now, with the state of uh, uh, film and acting and television and everything, to me, I think movies are dying an incredibly fucking slow death, <laughs> and people are just wasting all of their money. Oh, man. Um, because, like, you know, you get, and I know this is, like, the fucking, the precipice, but, like, you, you see a Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Like, how much money is going into a production of one episode? Right, right. Seven million dollars, ten million dollars, the fucking fifty million dollar battle scene they had to put on in the yeah. last season. But it's like you're watching an hour to an hour and a half of a movie every single week. Yeah. And 
now and that's on tv from, that's the, on, from the comfort of your own home exactly and you're and you have it you can have it whenever the fuck you want oh you you missed game of thrones at eight o'clock well cool you have it recorded and now at ten thirty, when you get off your shift you can catch it up right but and instead of trying to put an amazing story into an hour 45 to 45 because very rarely do you see a movie go over three hours. Right. Especially, especially not these days. We've well, well, gone with the wind. Well, and well now they're and, talking about the two-hour timeline is dead because they feel like, you know, after all the superhero backlash of, you know, oh, the director's cut Batman versus Superman was so much better. Oh, the Suicide Squad has so much cut. Now people are trying to justify, well, stop letting making us cut movies. So now yeah. people are trying to say, oh, it's got to be over two hours. Su- suicide, suicide Squad to me could have been amazing if it was three and a half hours long. I would have sat through it. If it had an extra 20 minutes. Yeah. An it, extra it was, 20 minutes, it yeah. Was, it was 2.40 or something yeah. like that. Man, like, we just can't get over suicide. I, dude, we were amped, it, though. It, <laughs> we it were amped. fucking hurts my soul. It hurts my no, soul. No, no. Batman vs. Superman, for me, I watched the director's cut. I liked it. But that's a movie, in my honest opinion, that you can re-edit and have it be perfect. Yeah. I think everything needed in that movie is already in that movie. just got re-edited in Batman vs. Superman. But, like, <laughs> God, we keep talking about that all day. But um, for me, though, I know people saying movies need, need to be longer, but not every family or person has that much time in a day to go to a theater. That's why they're watching TV. That's why they're watching TV. They can pause it, all that stuff, whatnot, you know. You know, in the previews, you gotta. I mean, you gotta add fifteen min- minutes mm-hmm. just for the previews. Yeah. Maybe twenty minutes. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a big movie, it's so you, even so that's you know, you got your day off. You just spending four day near three and a half, four hours at a movie theater, man. Yeah, a lot of people aren't gonna do on, that. On top of the cash that you got. On top spend. of the cash that you got to spend, and if you're going with somebody else, that's even longer. And yeah, and if they're not enjoying it, now you're like, dang, I gotta leave. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So that I, I I don't think it gets to that point. I think the event movies like the new Avengers and stuff like that, they'll let those. Go. The, yeah, the, they're going to take those to the wheels. They're going to let those off. go to the wheels fall off as long as they want. But I think for your, for most of the movies, you know, like the thrillers and the dramas and stuff like that, that gets kind of under the radar now. Like Den of Thieves. I don't know if you saw that. That was with uh, Fifty Cent mm-hmm. and, uh, and Max Holloway was in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I thought that was off the chain. You know what I'm saying? And that was a good two hours and in and out and got the action done. So movies like that are still being made. It's just they're just not being pushed and marketed like. A lot unless of, it's got the rock in it. Yeah, pretty much unless it's got the rock in it. And if you're in China, it's going to be pushed to you, man. Because yeah. China's new market now. They, yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you notice a lot of movies now, especially just straightforward action movies, it's, it's, it's more catered toward Chinese audiences. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just big, loud, expensive, colorful movies. Where the money's at. Where the money's at. You know, and yeah. like I said, it's all, if you put something out, you do want to get a return on your investment. But at the same time, it's like, you know, man, the movies we grew up on, like the Lethal Weapons, Die Hards, those movies probably most of those were made for under a hundred mil. Yeah. Even with inflation, they wouldn't have not be the most expensive movies ever. No, not even close. Like the movies, like type of movies I want to make are like that. Like I yeah. want the action comedies that are just down to earth, gritty, funny. Good buddy cop. Yeah, movie. good buddy cop movie. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Those movies you can make for cheap and still have them be great and yeah. still put a lot of good hardworking people uh, um, on the set. You know, to do the stunts and do all that stuff that you really love. Because man. I, the CGI stuff, dude. It, it does. It's, you could. It's. You, I know you hear it all the time, but it's like I watch Die Hard and I watch Gremlins, and those are two movies that were made with real people or puppets, mm-hmm. and that to me is still very, very charming. Yeah. And that and that doesn't date your movie at all. You know what I'm saying? Like Gremlins made in 1980s. Just watching that, it's still great to watch today, man. Right. It's just funny. So, just speaking of CGI, I was. I don't know. It's probably two months ago now I was watching the OG X-Men the very first one oh, that came man. out oh man the 2000 one yep 2000 that's and the one Hugh Jackman got his balls caught in the sling yeah I remember that's the first internet story I ever read for a movie Hugh Jackman when he goes over the Statue of Liberty his balls got caught in the sling so when you watch the movie when Sabretooth throws him and uh-huh. he catches himself that look on Hugh Jackman's face it's is real is really like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like that that was one of the funniest things I ever read I just remember, so I was, and I was and I was watching it with Kylie because, like I said, like I want her to watch the stuff that I watched yeah. as a kid too, you know. Because we turned out okay. <laughs> so, so I took a little work. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're getting there, damn it. But um, it's like so, right? What you're talking about, you know? Uh, it's the very end when they finally unveil the big machine. Yeah. And all the energy starts coming up and it's yeah. whirling, and I'm like, this looks fucking awful. <laughs> 
But I remember being seven years old, oh, convinced man. that I had to be convinced that that wasn't real because I had never seen CGI oh, that good before. Man. You, know? you know, CGI is best as at a, a minimal level. I at think. a minimal level, as a, like like some of the best CGI you've ever seen, you didn't realize was CGI. Right. CGI is great for background or support issue mm -hmm. like bad boys 2 actually has some of the best cgi i've ever seen yeah like the scene where uh the shootout in the jamaican house and the camera is going through the doorways yep. like those doorways are actually not there to cgi so the camera is able to go through like that scene is incredible cgi like the doorways and stuff were not there they've added that in post production also the freeway chase scene mm -hmm. a lot of cars on the freeway weren't there but you really can't tell because they cgi'd it perfectly so that's how you do CGI. When Especially in like, that's at the like the real beginning of like, of like real CGI. It was Bad Boy 2, 2004? 2003, 2003. 2003. 2003. 2003 was the year of speed chases. You had Bad Boys 2, yep. the Miami chase. You had The Matrix Reloaded, the oh, freeway oh, chase. No, no you had Too Fast, Too Furious. My shit. That was the shit, right? Yeah. So yeah, man, that was the year of the car chase. I'll never forget that. Dude, but yeah, but so like, with, like I said, with, with the CGI, it's just... Everything they're they're trying so hard now, right? So yeah. fucking hard. Yeah. It's like they're trying harder to, to do it now than when they first got the technology. Well, that's why the turnaround movies is hit or miss because you know it's like either the effects are gonna be good or not. So, I mean, when you have real people, you know, you know, old school blood, you know, you can get movies out there faster. Like the direct, I love the Undisputed movies. Scott Atkins, I don't know if you watched Ooh. that. Oh man, if you're you're a fighter, dude, you have to watch the okay. Undisputed movie. Like Michael Jai White. Scott Atkins, those movies are dope. Those two dudes should be like the top king of, kings of action right now because they're Michael Jai White, man. You want to talk about a legit martial artist? Oh, uh, that guy—he's a beast. He's in his fifties. Yeah. He yeah. looks like he's thirty. Crushing and he gets cats. right, crushing cats, like training real fighters. Like yeah. guys like him should be on top of every billboard. But yeah. you know, they're not superheroes, so they're right. not—they're not getting to play like they used to. But they still do get their recognition on like the direct to DVD stuff. And I try to buy that stuff too. Cause to support them. exactly. Cause yeah. they're, they're the real deal, man. And that's, that's an art form right there. Like your actors who really trained on stuff, this is what they do. And then you just put them in a movie to do what they want to do. They don't even have like that anymore. Like anybody can be trained for any role now. Yeah. You know, yeah, you got fucking Michael B. Jordan calling out Roy Jones Jr. And I was like, I love Michael B. Like Michael B. I love Michael B. I hope that was just like Fire out of for the movie. No, man. I think that was out of context. I, I'm, I, 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 I didn't you, hear. Have you heard the clip? I didn't hear the clip. I didn't hear the clip, man. They're like, oh, you look pretty good out in the ring right there. Blah blah blah. Oh, who's who's your favorite boxer of all time? And he's like, oh, Roy Jones Jr. And he's like, so how do you think you could do with Roy? He's like, well, back in the day, Roy get me. He goes, but I can hang with him now. Uh, I still haven't heard it, man. I still have not heard the clip. I haven't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna slam Michael B. over that, man. I mean, it could. Like I said, I think it's not. Kind of, I heard Roy did reply though. I was Roy, like, Roy was like, <laughs> Roy, Roy said, I've never ducked a fight in my life. I don't oh, care if you're man. an actor. I don't care who you are. Here's my agent. Here's all this. We could say, Roy fought this year. Uh, yeah, Roy. Roy He's 49 years old, out there whooping cats. Here's the thing, man. Fighters like that, they never lose it. No, you can. Yeah, I mean, he, even even if they're out of practice, you can step to any one of those guys. Yeah. You will, you will learn a harsh lesson. Yeah. It's just an instinct of. Just, it takes a special person to be a fighter. It's okay. not. It's not something you wake up, you know, exactly, and just do like. There's just something built in you right. to do that. Like, yeah. like I'm gonna take a hit from somebody, and I'm gonna keep coming at that. For yeah. you can't really teach that. That's. No. You, I'm sorry. That's that's from old Viking. Warrior Pri blood, like, pr like that's your old yeah. primal instinct, family tribe blood. That's just in you. That's just, and you, you can't just like, yeah, you can't just turn that off, man. No, absolutely not. And that's one thing I've really noticed, like you know, and I and I and I've always, you know, I've always heard that, but like, yeah, being in the gym, training with professional fighters, guys who've been in the UFC, guys who are still yeah. fighting in Bellator, it's like, I, you know, I played football, I played baseball, right. I ran track, all at a high level. You know, I've been around Division One athletes right. and trained with them. None of these guys work like this. Right. It's 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 not even fucking close. Right. The the work that they put in, the sacrifices that these yeah. guys make, the damage that they're taking to their body. Yeah. Just to go in, to have somebody else do that to them. Yeah. You know. It's, and and the thing is, fighters get such a bad rep for not being smart, but to understand the human body to that level, it takes so much intelligence, yeah. man. Like I think fighters know more about the body than people sit in the classroom right now. Absolutely. They do, man. It's just oh, it's mind blowing, and like. Every gym I worked at where a fighter would be hitting the bags or whatever. The, the, the scary thing about fighters, man, is that they're the most humble freaking people. They're the most humble people you would never know. 
And these are the guys some asshole will try to step to in the street, and it's like, bro, treat, that's gonna be the worst. Yeah, that's gonna be the worst night night of your life. Like, be 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 nice to people you don't know, because you them every dangerous person I know, they are just my most unassuming, and they'll just whoop you. And you know what? I I think that's honestly been my favorite part about training martial arts and jujitsu, especially because like at the end of the day, it's an individual sport. Yeah, but we is. are a team because yeah. I can't get better if you're not getting better. Right. And every single person wants to push you so they can get better. Right. And at the end of the day. We're trying to kill each other. Yeah. Like, we're training to kill each other. Right. And I have to have enough respect for you, and you have to have enough respect for me to know that I'm going to keep you safe, and you're going to keep me safe. Right. And it just, it, man, it, it creates this unwavering bond that I've never fucking seen before. Right. Like, in, like I said, in, I've, I've played team sports. I've done individual sports. But this especially is just... Yeah, like it's 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 a legitimate family, you know. So my uh, my professor Tracy, uh, his his father just passed away. Yeah, um, he was a good guy. I got to Tracy. Tracy Tracy's probably one of the best. Tracy's men an awesome guy. Like when you left me hanging because you're hungover. I was beyond hung. I didn't beyond yeah, hung. I didn't, for any, yeah. for those who don't know, Justin was he invited me out for jujitsu, and I'm there for months, for, for months, months, for, for months. months. And I'm like, I'll see you there, man. And I'm at there, and I got you know, I go up to the, the class, and Justin is not there, and I am. I'm kind of panicking, but at the same time, like I want to learn, and I'm already here. And Tracy was—he just welcomed me in. He he gave me some, you know, he gave me a gi, and it was three hours of just me going, "This shit is insane." Like yeah. it is not forget everything you think you know about fighting and standing up toe to toe. When there is a grown person on top of you, it, 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 it's just it's a whole different kind of panic. I don't, I don't care if you can bench 450. I pounds. don't. It, it's don't because it's not. It's gonna be the most unconventional crap you've ever felt in your life yeah like it's the real freaking deal it's man. It's, it's so much I, I i'm i would i just do not ever want to be in that position in life again no, man. It's, I ever it's, it's not it's uh and you and i went in there my very first day i you know played football for 10 years i've always been you know fucking a, a little above average of an athlete yeah. and you know i know i'm way stronger than most people my size and i thought i was going to go in there and i was going to hang with people like it's the humble sport my, <laughs> my very first day I got choked out by a 115 pound girl and she laughed at me. Oh my God, man. And there was nothing I could do. And you feel that blood choke. Like they, yeah. you know, you know, I, I, I wanted to be respectful. I'd be like, just do it to me like it's supposed to be done. And they did yeah. it. And I was like, oh my God. That, that, that sense of panic. That sense it's, of panic. Like yeah. you, you it, it's, it's just your whole body going, dude, you're about to go night, night. You need yeah. to do something now. Yeah. Like, Otherwise, I'm going to throw this towel in. You're going to wake up. <laughs> That's exactly. what your body's doing. Somebody's going to be holding your ankles <laughs> right, up. Right, right. Oh, fuck? my God. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the humbling sport of embarrassment. <laughs> it, well, and, and not only that, you know, it, it, it teaches you how to survive and adapt under all pressure. Right. Because if you can survive somebody trying to kill you, what's fucking... Yes. What, what's, you know, this guy merging onto the highway cutting you yeah. off have to do? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I got bigger shit to And that's why over. people should, everybody should take some sort of, like, combat just a little bit you know what I'm saying yeah. I, I'm one of those people that think they should teach boxing in schools honestly I, I do I think they should just put some headgear on sportsman gear it's just like I said it, and of course you're always going to have people going no you know you don't want to hurt the kids and now you're teaching them to be violent All right, and, and now you've got football you know parents who are like oh my son had calluses on his hands from football practice you know yeah. but people are missing out You, those instincts will always be in there if you can teach people to channel those instincts to be humble with them, be respectful, and just be, you know. Well, and, 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 and like you were saying, you know, most of these fighters, you, you know, you meet in their personal lives, they are fucking calm Yeah, people. so so now, yeah, teach your kids that. Just teach your kids that. Well, because, like, yeah. how, how long for, like, as as a human race, have we been taught to fight? Like, yeah. Fight for your life. You have to run from fucking right. animals that are trying to eat you and, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. Very, like... For a very short amount of time, we've lived, lived in a society where we are safe and we don't have to fight and mm -hmm. we don't have to go out and pillage and, you know, do right. all that shit. It's like, so that primal instinct is still fucking in you. Yeah, right? but even then, when you look at how we, you know, take care of our girls, you know, my nieces and your daughter, it's like, when they start dating, you're going to be like, okay, if something happens, this is what you yeah. do. We're still teaching people yeah. to fight. We just, Absolutely. subconsciously, we just don't realize it. But even every week, we're teaching people we love, like, hey, if this happens, right. light this motherfucker up. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it teaches them warning signs. The warning know, how, signs. So, how, how to adapt your so senses those, to what is so going So even on. though we've gotten comfortable, our instincts never kicked off. No. We're kind of, like, you're in a dark room. Your instincts are technically still doing that. And right. So I, I wish we'd just stop avoiding it and just kind of embraced it. And well, talk, and, talk and see, and it. that's the thing. Like, when you, when you face it head on, like one you're sharpening your instincts yes. and two you're, you're realizing what is real and what's not like a real sense of danger and how you can react and maybe it's not you know you see this guy 
who's rearing up a punch to come hit you. Right. But you can feel the energy coming off yes, this guy. That's who, weird. Right. That's weird because you know what it's like when somebody's intense. Right. right? It's and like, and yeah. you can match that energy with them. Yeah. But And you can choose to address it or choose to get out of it. Right. But, you know, you get people who have no idea what they're doing. And it's, you know, fight, flight, fear, whatever the hell you want to call it. And they get into a situation and they just blow the fuck up. Right. Because... They, this is, this is, it's all coming out and they don't yeah. know how to handle it. Yeah. You, you know? Yeah. Like, if there's a fight happening in public between a fighter and then another guy who's not trained... The fighter contains the situation. Right, but they're experiencing the same adrenaline. Yeah. But I know how to handle this. I know what's going to go down. I know how this can play out. But if... I think half of the fights that happen in public are people fearing the unknown. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Like, what was the video you showed or we watched? It was... It was... I forgot what his name. He was a jiu-jitsu guy, UFC... And it was some dude in a restaurant. Oh, Matt Sarah. Yeah, and Matt he sat Sarah. on the guy. He contained the situation. Yeah. He had all that. He knew what was going on. And that's what happens when people are trained. They know how to exactly. You, you know, know, versus two assholes just tearing tables up, throwing bottles, hitting innocent girls in the face with elbows. And right. See, he's, you know, he's he's in a he's in a, a nice full mount. Yeah. Got his knees and his armpits. Where Telling he needs the guy, to be. calm down, calm, calm down. down. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, and that's what we teach our kids too. Yeah. Like, um, at, at the kids class, like. We don't teach you to do jiu-jitsu to go out there and fuck people up. Right. We teach you so you can protect people and you can protect yourself. Exactly. And, you know, obviously we have kids that range from 5 to 16. Right. And, you know, you get a, a 9-year-old boy or an 11-year-old boy who... He's got that energy. He's got that energy yeah. and some kid is messing with him. Like, we have kids that will fuck up adults. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, and it's like, and these kids know that. So we teach them, like, especially at this age, it's position control. Right. You know... You know that you can dominate this person physically or mentally or bait them into getting, you know, giving an arm or their neck or whatever. But you being able to hold this person down and restrain them right. is more important because your goal is not to hurt anybody. Your goal right. is to keep everybody safe and protect yourself if you have to. Right. So like I said, we, we try and teach that at the kids level. Like, you know, if a kid's picking on you at school and he throws a punch, don't choke him out. Don't triangle him. But take his back. Right. Hold him there. Secure his arms. Or get inside control. Keep him down. Get in full mouth. Keep his arms pinned where he can't. Touch your face. All right. You know, number one rule in jiu-jitsu, if they can touch your face, they can kill you. Yeah, pretty, yeah that's a good rule. That's a you good know? freaking rule, man. So that's, that's something I always, always try like to do. The, the cool common thing I notice in a lot of crafts or just life in general between jiu-jitsu, acting, all this stuff, is that it's just more about not focusing on what you can't control, but focusing on what you can control right. and using, utilizing that to your best ability, man. Right, because everything in life is reactive. It you. is. So it's your plan has to be as well. Your plan has to be reactive as well. You know, um, don't focus so much on things going wrong. It's just when things go wrong, it's, okay, what do I have to do right. now? When the shit hits the fan, you know how to step to the side right. of the fan. Right, step to the fight. Exactly. You got to know how to step to the side of the fan. You know, working where I've, you know, we've been in warehouses, we've had all the mm -hmm. jobs, and there's always two types of guys. There's the guys who kick ass and they're in control. They might even be having a bad day, but they like, I ain't got time for that. I just got to focus right. on what I can do now. And those are the guys that get things done. Then you got the guys who everything goes wrong because they just they just won't focus. They're like, this is wrong. I'm going to cry about this for 15 minutes. And then uh, I'm mad about this and that. And it's your fault. And, this, and it's like, right. dude, why are you even here? Yeah. Like, you know... You, You've got all these things you can take care of to get shit done, and you're still crying about it. So about that one small thing, and that that bad energy and that lack of focus on the next task is setting the domino effect to ruin everything. It else. really like, is. Like, it really is, man. It, it's just a complete domino effect. Like uh, I am thinking about going on to like bigger markets now. You know what I'm saying? And I know that in order for me to do that, I had to focus in on here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the things that you want you're being trained for the things you want but sometimes you're not being trained in the way you think you are right like i'm very grateful for the warehouse gig i got because i've been working at this warehouse for 10 years and then been working with my employees and i've just been seeing all types of attitudes and work ethics and i've been hearing a lot of kind of stories and more importantly i've just been learning like wow this is training me to understand people better mm -hmm. so if i go onto a set it's like i know somebody who's been through this you know it's kind of how that weird way that god and the universe works is that I'm, I'm, I'm taking what I have where I'm at right now and building myself a path with it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they're kind of frustrated because they're not exactly where they want to be. It's like, no, look around you. Everything you need is right around you. The people, the stories, the resources, right. you know, uh, the, it's just look around you and you'll see that, oh, I can use this for this and I can use that for that. Like right. it's right there. And until you learn to do that, you're going to be stuck 
But you, you have to learn to use where you're at now because you can't keep focusing about tomorrow because tomorrow, you know, that may not get there. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, might have, you, you gotta do you it. Have no saying that. Right. Yeah. Like I'm a, I am where I am today because I kinda learned to roll with the punches and take what I had every day and just build something with it, man. It's consistent action. It's every day. It's not one move over the whole year. It's every freaking day. Right. It's it, it's it's it, it's chess. It is. It's it freaking is chess, chess, man. Like if you if you wanna go back to me starting with acting, it started with me going to auditions, it started with me on those then being doing background work, and then with that background work, me talking to people, seeing how, what they did, and then being cool with them, and then they referred me to something, so I got a little bit more work, and then after having a good rep with those people, I got called back to do a little bit bigger work, and then after that, then I'm having a line or two, then after that, I'm getting called to do you know a whole video, you know, and training videos, and then after that, I refer to somebody, and they send me to an agent who meets a bigger agency, who has bigger customers in a bigger market, say, hey, he's doing good where he's at now. We can trust him. He's got a good rep. And then I'm doing a commercials, and then I'm doing another commercial. And next thing you know, I'm freaking doing short films, and then I'm right. doing an end. It's just, it's just a whole pattern. Right. It's, it, it's, not, it's not one day right. you got this big-ass package dropped off at your no, house. Any, but right. you, you had all these little bitty steps yes. that made that one big thing. That time is going to pass anyway. You might as well spend it learning and doing good and being patient and being thankful. Right. That's any freaking thing like that's you know you hear a lot of people who say i want to do music i want to do acting and stuff like that and it's kind of like okay what are you doing now right. well, well i'm not doing anything right now it's like well then well, how the hell do you expect this right. going to happen right well and, and, and how do you know you want to do this if you've never done it right exactly man exactly just just go to an acting school you yeah. know what i'm saying like i think i think a lot of i think sport movies are great because they're kind of physical it showed a physical embodiment of that spirit mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying with the training and all that stuff it's like if you say you want to be a, a world heavyweight champion you're not going to get in that ring right away. No. You take your ass to a boxing school, and right. then you learn, and then you go through the process, and then you work your way up through the amateur. And that, you know, People can see that with the sports and the physical, but they don't see that during their everyday stuff. Right. They don't see that through the arts. They don't see that through their office space, even though that's what it is, man. Right. Like I've got guys who have been there for years and haven't gone anywhere because they just don't want to... They just come they, in and clock in. Yeah, and they don't want to spend the extra 15, extra 15 minutes learning how to do a forklift or something like that right. versus a guy who comes in, who came in last month, runs his butt off, and now he's like, hey, I want to learn a fork. And now he stays the extra 15, 20 minutes after work to right. learn a fork. And now this guy's about to move up. But guess what? When that guy who put the extra time in gets that shot and that promotion, that guy who's been around for four or five years. This guy's only been here for exactly, fucking two months. Exactly. And, even though we gave you the shot. You yeah. didn't want to put the extra yeah. 20 minutes yeah. a night in. And, 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 you and know those what? are the same people who say, they're trying to shut me. Nobody, we wanted you to yeah. have, but that, you will not take the extra time. That, that, that scarcity mindset of like... Somebody else's success is your failure. Yes, is it's just it's, bullshit. It's, it's, and, it, <laughs> and, it, and it's so damn prevalent, man. Like, oh my god, so, <laughs> people people think just because oh you know Ronnie's been here for two weeks and this motherfucker got a raise already. Well, Ronnie's also worked sixty five hours. Yes, man. In the last two weeks, it's, this is and a, you called in twice last week. Yes, this is a, a lot of stuff is individually based, man. It is. Yeah. It is. Like I understand there are people, there are programs out there and stuff that are meant to like that will shut you down or will kind of put a cap on you, mm -hmm. but there are people out there who are just hungry, man. Like, I love meeting hungry people who are just like, where's the opportunity at? I'm going to yeah, chew this. What's up? What's up? What's up? Like, what are we like, going to do? Like, those people, like, you, you have to find people like that in every room. You, yeah. you know, that's the cool thing about being a new student in something, because you, you go there, you find the hungriest person in the room, and you're just going to step your game up to a whole other level, because you, you get off, you feed off of that energy, yeah. well, man. Energy's real, man. Energy, like, it's I, so I, fucking a real. freaking doubt. Is if you've ever been on a road trip with anybody, then you can tell yes. who you're riding with. Yes. Who you're riding with is just, it's just, it's just is either this going to be the best three hours that's going to fly by, or it's going to be the longest three hours. Dude, oh my that, god, dude! I, that might be the perfect test. It is. That might be the perfect if test you, to if see you, if energy. If you want to see if somebody should be your life, just just ride in the car with them, man. Yeah, honestly, yeah. and pass them the cord. <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> you know what? I think the real test is how much music do you really listen to? Uh, you know, man. That's like I, I like a good successful car ride to me. If we're both awake, we're talking the whole time. We're having that's true. That is the like, truth. Because you know? me and my partner Nick, man, he uh, he rode with me up to Kansas City one time. 
for an audition, and then we recently went up to Kansas City for a wedding, and we barely listened to music, man. Yeah. We, we just vibe, man. And I'm like, man, I try to hate on him, but I'm like, you my boy, because I can sit here and just shoot the shit with you, and this ride goes by fast. Every single time. Every single time, Every man. single time. Every single time, dude. Like, those are the best kind of people. I think music's more of just like, I don't know, I love music. I do think it fuels my workouts, but it's more of a space saver when you got nothing, you know, when you're just trying to vibe and versus if I'm really motivated I'll listen to a podcast or I'll listen to yeah. like a motivational video or something mm-hmm. or listen to like an audio book but yeah you know I think I think also people underestimate the value of just turning everything off and disconnecting just disconnecting yeah honestly it, it like I said that first hour we talked about earlier that makes a huge difference just yeah. disconnect it. don't turn the YouTube on don't turn the music on just kind of Get back into your yourself. Go back to yourself. Go right. back to the basics. And a, and a lot of people are afraid to be there. So many people are afraid to be inside of their own head. You, you, honestly, you. A lot of people will benefit from just going back to basics. Yeah. If you feel like things are just getting a little too out of control, like last year, I was, I was, after after the sprint thing, I did have a lot of pressure on myself. It's like, okay, I, if I'm gonna just be a one, and I can't just be a one hit one. Right. I gotta do this. So now every other day, I was driving out of town, going to audition, blah 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 blah. You know, you can only do that so much until everything just goes, pump the brakes, kid. Yeah. You, you've got plenty of freaking time. I think so many people try to control everything that they get themselves this kind of anxiety, but there are some things that are just out of your control. You just got to do the best you can when you can. And I even had like kind of a mental breakdown. So my boy, like, dude, I don't know what's going on. It's like my, my, my head is, my head space is just all jacked up right now. Right. He goes, just let it out, dude. You're good. And I just had to breathe, and I just had to disconnect, and I had to say, it's not, it doesn't matter what other people think. You know, I got to look at myself. I got to think of what I went through. And from where I'm at now to where I started, I did okay. And I don't have to impress anybody else. If you're going to do this, it's got to be for why you want to do it. Right. Because most people don't give a shit. Uh, at you, all. You buy, you buy a new car. You pull up, people go, wow, that's a nice new car. And the next day, that's an old car. That's an old car. Yeah. It's an old car. And now you have a bunch of debt. So now yeah. if I buy a car, it's going to be you. Yeah. But you still have those people who give themselves anxiety and debt and all that because they care so much about what other people think. Everybody, everybody, yeah, exactly. Everybody's in their own race of their own. Best thing we can do is just let people know it's okay to breathe, go at your own pace as long as you're learning, as long as you're doing right. something for it, it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's as okay. long as you know where you want to go. Exactly. Just take steps. It's all good. But, you know, like you can't be around a yes, man. You can't be around people that have you try to buy someone. Like, don't be around those people, man. Right. You can't. Like, you, you will go crazy trying to control it all and trying to impress it all. There's a book, and I, I wish I could remember the title. Uh, my friend Abby, actually, she told, gave me a quote from it. Shout yeah. out to Abby. Shout out to Abby. <laughs> right. Abby Swain. <laughs> my, my Kate Winslet to, and to my Leo. That's nice, kind of our, nice. all right. We met in acting class, and she's a hell of a good friend. Her and her husband are good people. But uh, there's a quote in this book, and it said, like, a third of the people you meet are going to get you. Another third is going to hate you. Then another third is going to be in between. And that's just how it's always going to be. You can accept that and then just move on with your life. And I think that's the problem with like the social media like I've come to the point where I don't post every moment like right now I'm just vibing with you right. I don't need to post people right now know. I'm just going to be in this moment with my boy Justin and just enjoy it you know what I'm saying yeah. but there are people out there that try to take every great moment they have and put it out there make for sure the, everybody sees and it everybody sees it and when nobody else loves it or appreciates it that much and they only get two likes right. that moment somehow is just less special yeah. Like, no, that's bullshit. Right. Give, give your life more credit than that. Like, right. it, it wasn't for them, so they're not going to like it. You're not going to get a thousand likes for a moment that wasn't meant for them. Mm-hmm. Enjoy your own moments, man. It, it's just, dude, just growing up is mind, <laughs> mind blowing, dude. Yeah. It, but I'm glad I learned this crap now, man. I am. Well, and, and it's, I think, I think growing up in the age of technology and instant gratification yeah. is really what is even the weirdest part. Because, like, how many auditions have you been on that you didn't book? I didn't. I don't keep track of those. Exactly. I they, don't. Because they don't matter. They, they, don't, they don't matter. They matter. do not matter. Only thing that matters is... You invested was I, in yourself. I invested in myself and I had another experience toward what I wanted to do. Right. And that's how I know I love I wanted to act. Because it wasn't about I didn't get that part. It's like, oh, I got to go out and do something I wanted to do. Right. You know, the audition, the training, all that is a part of acting. Yeah. Just like as a fighter, the, the eating, the conditioning, the stuff, the work put in that people don't see, that's all a part of the fire. What you see in the ring, 
That's the result of all that hard the work. The fruits of the labor. The fruits of the labor. What you see on the screen of what I'm doing, that's the result of the fruits of the labor. But that whole process before that, I love that shit too. Yeah. And if S- I didn't sitting like, in the waiting room, having those nerves, having your your right. time, your heartbeat. Oh, Raymond Roberson. Right. That, door that, that is. Yeah. That that's my thing, man. Yeah. And and I have a I have friends who like served in the military, like badasses, like combat, and they say. There's no way in hell I could get in front of people. And I'm like, are you serious? Right. You serve the military. It's, it's everybody's cut and they've got something different in them, man. Yeah. I'm like, you you served in the military, dude. He's like, I, I rather I rather face. I'd rather go back to Iraq and <laughs> then, drive, then, drive a tank. Yeah, I rather and then then get in front of people. So yeah. everybody everybody has their thing and they need to just love themselves and respect themselves and understand that you're just cut from a different cloth and that we've all got a job to do and we just gotta take that and run with it. But it just blew my mind when he told me that and I was like, what? Because, oh, man. And, right. you, and, you, you've been to the deepest, darkest places of this world. Right. Exactly. And I, I took a buddy with me onto an audition. And I just, I kind of realized how different it was. Because he was like, hey, like, dude, oh, my God. Like, you know, he just rolled with me because I needed somebody to roll with me. He's like, oh, my God, dude, we're going to audition. And I'm just trying to get in my head space. And I'm just cute, chill. And I'm just mellow. And, you know, I'm signing in, all that stuff. And then, you know, it was ghost Was he time. auditioning or not? Yeah, he was auditioning. Okay. He actually came with me for the AMC thing. Uh and you know my and I always try to like you know if if it's like a cool background extra thing and I want somebody to roll with me because I, so I can make the drive and I don't yeah. have to be by myself I'll try to bring a friend or something like he was my roommate at the time too and uh, he was like amped and I was just like in my headspace and I was like it's, it's all it's good man day. it's just another day it's man another day. I mean I, I'm amped but I'm amped in a different way I'm yeah. not scared I'm more excited right you know what I'm saying there, when you when you can take that those butterflies in your stomach and make it like I'm excited that's when you start just killing shit dude so and, and, and my professor Tracy he says this a lot um, you know anxiety could be your best friend or your worst enemy yeah because it lets you know every single time exactly what you need to work on or what you feel you need to yeah. work on you know yes so it's like do you take that and let it cripple you and ruin your life or you take that okay cool yeah I am fucking anxious about this but I know that I can do this this is what I need to do yes. if I can't do it and alright so now I know the steps and now I can lay it out and fucking keep yes if there's forward. something you're nervous about then you need to just do some homework that's right. it I right. mean like you said, if you feel that and, you, and you, you know, you ask them, okay, what are you nervous about? What are you anxious about? This, this, and that. Well, then work this, this, and that. Right. And then by the time the day comes, you should have all your, you know, stuff together. Yeah. It, it, very rarely does the body lie to you. It, re- it very rarely does, you know, man. They yeah. say you trust your heart, trust your gut. It very rarely because, does. Because for how long has that shit been working? Right. It's, it's been just, working, for me, 32 years. Right. It's been all right. Exactly. <laughs> it's doing pretty good, man. Exactly. And a lot of things that my gut said were going to fall through, fell through. And, you know, a lot of people, I was like, this ain't right. It wasn't right. And, it, like, you just got to you just gotta trust yourself more. You just yeah. got to trust that God put you together right. Absolutely. You know? Like, and that you can do this, or whatever it is you're doing, man. Like, you know, like, my mom constantly, she's like, she wants me to get married. <laughs> it's like, I just haven't met the girl. Right. And... I, but from all my experiences in life, I just know that, you know, the girl I meet, it's not just going to be the good days that I got to want to be with her. Right. I got to be want to be with her on the bad days. Right. I got to want to be with her on the days where she, you know, she's just not feeling well and all that stuff, you know. And, and I think our relationships now are still kind of messed up because we do that, that glamorizing, that idolizing, like we say about the social media. Mm-hmm. People have this. Idea. Every day they're perfect. Yes, you see that? yes. They posted three selfies. Oh my god! Week. Yes, and yeah. I'm like, dude. If my next relationship's not on Facebook, I would just be so happy because yeah. that means we're not caring what anybody thinks yeah. and we're doing our thing. You, you, you have your relationship to focus on. Yes, not yes. Your your projection of your relationship to everybody else to know that. You're yes, happy. if our relationship's about our ego and about posting so that we make other people feel lesser, that relationship's gonna fall because right. when other people don't give a shit what we're doing, then we're gonna be like, oh well, this is not working then. Right. Like, and that's bull. People don't think we look well together. Right, you know? right. I like. I'm not like if I'm buying her stuff to just so I can say I bought her some stuff, even though it's not stuff she asked for or wanted. Right. I'm not a good boy because I'm not listening to this girl. You right. know what I'm saying? It's the ego is another thing that's just killing us. We gotta just let that crap go, man. And and that's something I've you know I've I've really had to you know tailor off myself is like and all of us do, man. I, it, I've done that too. You know, we all just yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I I just I just felt like <laughs> we're dudes. We f up that is, <laughs> that especially and like I you know I was always like the the popular kid, right. quote unquote, and 
you know, I played high end that I was a high end athlete, and then right. you know, just enough. exactly. <laughs> and then I blew my shoulder out. My, you know, I had a kid after high school. All, all, ba- all just for the record, all badasses blow their shoulder out at least once. At least, <laughs> at least, you ain't working hard. Enough. You're not working hard enough, yeah. so you pop a shoulder. I got, a, I, got a, I got a good buddy, Gabe. He always uh, says he's got too much horsepower for his chassis. Right, and, exactly. And just, just, just fucking happens. It just happens, <laughs> man. But yeah, no. So like, I, you know, I flirted and not flirted but i was <laughs> always with the fact that i was i'm the top of the fucking food chain right i am an alpha i am this this is me you can't tell me nothing and it got in the way of my relationships with my friends yeah. my relationship with you know fucking women with my parents yeah you know because like they were gone most of my childhood you know my dad traveling 40 weeks out of the year my mom working nights my yeah. brother passed away my sister left after my brother died and so it's like I thought I was like, this is fucking me. I'm doing all this shit on my own. Like, ain't nobody going to fucking tell me nothing. Yeah, man. And then I really got on my own. And, and then you realize, okay. I know nothing. Yeah. I know nothing. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like the best thing that can happen is for you to be alone sometimes. Yeah. Right? A lot of times. Yeah. I mean, you're supposed to be with people because it's good to be with other people because they're kind of a reflection of you. But when things really hit the fan and there's you know you're by yourself you have to reflect on yourself right. you can't project your negativity or your insecurities onto someone else like if you're in a relationship and you have insecurities you're not taking it out on you no you're putting it on her right. and, and that's not fair to her and you're waiting for that fight to happen yeah for her to address what you have going on yes and now you're defensive like oh, what's oh, you're gonna right. say i really act like this we're supposed to be together you right. love me and you're gonna tell me i'm fucking selfish right right all the things of, i do for you is yeah. like no you're not doing that for her man right. you're doing that for you so you can feel better about yourself and say that you're doing what you're supposed to do but you've got so many issues inside like I, I'm with you man I was on the same train I was in a relationship and I just had you know I wasn't pursuing acting I wasn't making steps I wasn't doing all the things in my life right. I wanted to do I wasn't doing volunteer work like all the things that I've always wanted to do I was not even just taking the smallest step right. and, I, and instead of looking at myself in the mirror saying you need to get your shit together Instead, you start blaming people. Well, if I wasn't with, with this, them, or or, or if I wasn't together. with them, or if I wasn't stuck in this job, or and you know, it's just it's just so many people. It's it's very hard and scary to look in the mirror and say yeah. you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing because yeah, that means everything. Man. That means everything you have is just not not is is not where you're supposed to settle at. And the scariest thing is having to pack your shit up and keep going. That right. is, it's so scary. Fuck yeah, uh. yeah. The, the 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 ability to be able to assess yourself react and yeah. formulate a plan man is just one not a life skill that's fucking taught it, enough oh you just hit the nail on the head man. and oh my god you know like i said <laughs> you know like, my, like you know both of us we grew up upper middle fucking class we, threw, in we, the we grew up good and we were yeah. never ashamed of that you yeah. know and i wasn't gonna talk shit on my dad for giving me a good life i hate when people try to right. be like you know no my, our fathers worked their yeah. butt off yeah i mean i remember when when I was five years old, my dad was still driving trucks. Right. And he was working seven days a week and would go and work at 5 a.m. We would have to get dropped off at 3.30 in the morning yeah. at the our, babysitter. Our dad and, did double-digit days always. Every, still yeah, do. Still, still do, do man. Yeah. Double-digit double digit days, man. And it's just like, I don't take that for granted. But I think the thing, with, and everybody's talking about masculinity now, is just that it's A, it's really hard seeing grown men cry. Yeah. You know, we could watch girls cry all the time, yeah. but it's hard seeing grown men cry. And, you know, in terms of, like, you just hit the nail on the head, that's not really taught to us how to process and to deal with insecurities. Because now it's like, oh, your man just be with it. But, not, uh, you know, your man just deal with it. Or, you know, well, the best way to get over relationships is just smash all the, right. you know. It, Find something to follow. Right, 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 right. And it's just, it's just all really bad teaching, man. Yeah. It doesn't teach you to really hit the reset or the cleanse or any of that. It's just teaching you to stack issue on top of issue on top of issue coping mechanism type of coping mechanism because right. for me coping mechanisms was you know going on dates and just being seen with girls or yeah. just you know going to the bar and just doing some shots or you know you know right. what i'm saying and right. everybody's and that's a lot of people just have coping mechanisms now it's things that can make them feel popular in that moment but the moment they are by themselves and that moment is over it is just hell yeah it is just empty in hell and and I, and I struggle with that a lot too especially because like i said i was always that party popular kid right right and every weekend i was going somewhere I right. was at, you know but that's because you just couldn't be by yourself man and i couldn't you couldn't be I, by yourself I, I absolutely could not yeah. and because i you know i spent so much time alone as a kid you know like i said my dad worked traveled 40 weeks right. a year my mom worked nights my brother was gone like i'm in this big ass house 
by my fucking right. self. I was doing everything I could just to get out. Right. You know. Because you had to, if you you had to sit and deal with the emotion, if you yeah. Were. And you just don't know how to deal with the emotion. No. You don't. No. You don't like. Like, God, what am I supposed to do with this? I'm supposed to write down. Like, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. And, you know, like, my folks moved away 10 years ago, and so much has happened since then. You know, and I have, I've had a good life. I'm not saying that. But I think in terms of growing pains and dealing with people, learning things, relationships, you know, like, uh, it's just nobody really sits, hey, when this happens to you, this is how you're supposed to respond. Or when this happens to you, don't start doing this and that because that's just going to make it worse. Right. As a matter of fact, our society kind of teaches the opposite. Yeah. And it's, and now we're starting to see that it's all bullshit. You know, we're starting to hear about, you know, we're seeing all those ideal couples we love getting divorces mm-hmm. and all that crap. And it's just like the best thing people can do is just be real and say, hey, everything's not okay. We're fighting every day to get this together, but we're going to come out on top because we're being real about the pain we're feeling. We're addressing the actual issue. The actual issue. The actual issue. Right. And sometimes you do need those friends that, like I said, to just know you so well. Be like, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you, but there's what something. There's yeah. something deal. And, you know, you know, you can't be afraid to offend your your friends. You, and, and, and if that's the case, you guys aren't friends. You, you aren't friends. You aren't friends. Yeah, you are not friends. My buddy Justin, his wife's a psychiatrist, and she every time I hang out with them, she calls some shit out in me. I love it though because I didn't realize it. She like the other day, I was talking about my diet. I'm like, man, I just eat blah 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 blah. She goes, uh, uh-huh. uh, do you eat when you're stressed out? I goes, yeah. She goes, oh, you're a stress eater. And I was like, shit, I am a stress eater. Yeah. And then the other day, uh, when I did my first pumpkin carving, I was making a Spider Man. I, I spent like three hours on this thing, dude. And then she was like, hmm. Anybody ever tell you you have perfectionist tendencies? And I was like, I am a perfectionist. Yeah, and that's that. and that's why you get that's how I get anxiety though, because if it's not perfect, you yeah. know, I'm like, I hate it. But yeah. just having somebody call that out is just like, oh my God, thank you. Cause now that I know what it is, I can just deal with it better. Yeah. And I think also it's just we have to let people know uh it's okay to you just it's okay to talk to your parents. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I, you know, we're always reluctant. We want to show that we're, you know, young man, we got together. We're independent. We're, we're strong, independent we and strong. Together, but yeah. if you got a grandparent or an uncle or a mother, it is okay to call them and be like, look, this is what I'm dealing with. Because you think there's going to be some crazy overreaction, but they've lived through that stuff, right? right? They felt what we're feeling. Right. And they don't want to pressure you, but they also want you to know, like, hey, you can come to me about anything. My pops told me that in like, not to the past couple of years, I've actually really started taking him up on that. And in my life is just really, I've really been able to get through a lot, man. Like, I feel bad for a lot of people who just don't have somebody feel like they yeah. can just pick up and call. Because that makes a huge difference. Be like, man, this relationship in it, I don't know how I feel about it. Like, that, what am I supposed to do with my life? Blah, blah, blah. You have people you can talk to. And that makes a huge difference, man. Yeah, man. It, t- it, t- it takes a village. Whether it's it really to oof. fucking be happy or whether it's to have an actual village that's, right. you know, successful. Right. But, like, right. you, you, you have to have... You know, a good support system, like you were saying. You know, the, the the people that are closest to you is a reflection of you know your deepest self. Yeah. And you know, if you can't, if you can't relate or be able to you know reach out to the people who are blood related to you, you yeah. know, and have have their life dedicated to you, right. no matter what, then what the fuck? What else do you have? Right. What else do you have? You right. Know? Right. So, and that's in like that's something I've been you know struggling more and more with as as I get older, is because like like you said. I do. Th- I'm, I'm only 25. I think, oh, I got this. I got this shit fucking right. figured out. I can fucking do this. Right. But at the end of the day, yeah, I'm fucking 25. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I'm going to tell you this right now. When you get to 32 like me, you realize everybody's still winging it. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, and, and, everybody is winging this thing, I, man. And I think that was, that, was, that was a big realization for me in my life, too. It was like, you don't wake up one day and no. like, I'm an adult. You know, it's like, do, do you still feel 18? No. It's what I'm saying. It's like, I still feel 20, but I don't feel 18. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's just like, you you don't have this one, you know, day where it's like, oh, I'm a man now. Right. I have to do this. Because how many fucking 35-year-old guys are living in their mom's basement, working part-time at a gas station? It happens, man. Right? Exactly. Because they're not fucking growing up. Right, and right. Age doesn't mean you're growing up. It doesn't. Moms, mom, you know, I should say that too, man. I, I, think, I think growing up is just knowing how to process things and being a little bit more patient, but also looking internally before you go, you know, put the blame on something else. Right. That for me, that's the biggest sign yeah, of that's growing the number up. One that's step. the number one step of growing yeah. up. But when something or, you know, before you react, you go, okay, what could I have done to prevent this? And if this is not on me, then I'm going to speak up for myself. Right. 
But a lot of times when you look inward, you're like, okay, I, I should have. Right. This happened because I let my guard down. I let or this, this fucking happen. Or this let happen because I didn't address this issue with myself. But if it wasn't your fault, then yeah, you speak up, speak up for yourself and you move on with your life and you cut that negativity out, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, that's, and I feel like so many people are focused on the outside negative that yeah. they won't even realize what they have going on inside of them. And I, and I think that's why we have this culture right now that is just crucifying everybody. Everybody. everybody right. Like, you can't post a joke without... And I think it, it goes back to Scarface, man. I was watching Scarface over Thanksgiving, and that scene where he's at the dinner table uh-huh. saying, there's the bad guy, that is probably the most relevant speech now yeah you need someone like me to say there's the bad guy so you don't look at yourself right and i think that's what's happening it's like most of these people didn't give a shit about a certain issue till a week ago and now you know you want to start calling people out on something you just found out about yesterday yeah you want to post hateful stuff or comments on them so you can say that this person's a bad guy even though some people you know make mistakes and they accidentally tell a joke that shouldn't be told or so i mean there's certain things that come how many jokes have you said that should never have been told and no, I, I used to do stand. I remember I told a really, really. I was it was at Zumwalt North, and I told a joke that was a little probably too raunchy, <laughs> and I had come back, and it, you know it was just one of the things that in the moment I was a young comedian, I was nervous, and uh, it was just a and, and, this, and this is at a high school. And this is at a high. All right, this is at this is like the this is after I graduated. I came back the next year, and I told one joke that to this day I'm like, man, I, why did I say that? Because it was just it was just a I was just a young nervous comedian. I told one joke. And it was like, ooh, man. But, you know, some people laugh and some people are like, dang. Right. But it's like. But now think, think about this. If so that think, happened today. Or if somebody had a video of that. Somebody probably does have a video right. of that. And, and that video comes out Ten today. years from now. Right. <laughs> but even then, I'm not going to apologize for it. No. I'm not. Because you know what? The difference between me and that person who releases the video is that I got caught on video. Yeah. Point blank period. The sirens are coming for me, guys. No, uh, joke. no. Joke, joke police. Joke police. No, and and I don't judge people. That's another thing of growing up. You don't judge people different from you or who make mistakes as harsh as you. And when I say mistakes, I'm not talking something like freaking this, you know, psycho Bill Cosby who roofied women. That dude was a monster. That's not a mistake. That's not some shit. You just go, oh, I'm just gonna. Do you know who brought that to light? Who? Hannibal, Hannibal Burris. Burris. Hannibal right. fucking Burris. Shout out to Hannibal, Hannibal Burris. Shout out to Hannibal Burris. You know, that's not a mistake. So if you're trying to think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Fuck you. That's, that's not a mistake. You don't do shit like that to people. Uh, I'm talking like sometimes you get to talking and you and nerves make you say inappropriate. Like a lot of people say inappropriate stuff when they get nervous. Oh, absolutely. A lot of people do. And, you know, especially if you never talked to women before. There are guys who just are absolutely terrible talking to women and you watch them and they just say crazy. And it's like, bro, what are you doing? Right. So a lot of people have a lot of strange reactions to nerves, or anxious or just, you know, and, and like even the thing with James Gunn. Yeah, the Guardian Galaxy thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, yeah, I hated those jokes. I, I don't know why the hell he would tweet something like that out. But at the same time, it was like it was ten years ago. He never really hurt a kid. What? 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 The? It's like what now? You know what I'm saying? It was it was bad humor. But but there are, but it's humor though because some people do find those jokes. Some funny. people find those jokes funny. And and you know Patrice O'Neill, R.I.P. Patrice O'Neill. Oh, is that, is Patrice, se- I love Patrice. Seven years last week, I think. Oh man, Patrice um, is the yeah, Patrice. Yeah, but I love he, his humor. He, he said it best. He goes, as a comedian or as an entertainer, I will never apologize for my work, right. or especially the attempt to be funny. It was an because, attempt, right? Because if one person laughs, that means that was funny, right? If a thousand people don't laugh. And that one person does. That doesn't change the fact that it wasn't funny. Right. And that it was funny. Right. Because that person felt it was funny. Somebody felt emotion out of that. Yeah, but it's so many people gang up on someone now. And it's like... Right, that's what it is. It's, it's, it's the mob mentality. It, it is. It's a super mob mentality. And it's bro- And the thing is, it's more internet than anything. Because these people aren't going to the house yeah, and going... Yeah, like, well, look, look, look at the team that I'm right, on. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what it is. It's about hashtagging and saying, oh, I am support this, right. I support that. But if you took away the internet, how many of those people would really step out of their way? to go to the streets right. or go to the house or go off of support or do volunteer work for these same issues that they're supposedly so upset and up in arms about. Right. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's the thing that bugs me. That's why I'm like, don't be a hashtag warrior. You know, I, I got this thing where I want to do volunteer work again. My mom, she used to work at a home. You know, I grew up helping her when she went at the home and taking care of people. And, you know, my, my family, they always been involved in church. So just volunteer work is a huge thing. Like, I got cousins in the military, uncles in the military. So I feel like generally I have to every couple. Provide I, your service. I have to provide a service. If you're not going to be in a military or something, you should at least 
do something right, on the weekend. Like even if you're a millionaire, if you want to make sure your kids don't grow up to be a piece of crap, have them do service work. You know, yeah. so they get the idea that it's not just about me; it's about That's helping others. Work. Right? Any work, right? Yeah. Any work. So it's like there's a lot of people aren't doing that. They're hashtagging. They're mad. They're posting. Oh, this person's mad. I'm one of you guys. You know, misery loves company, like mm-hmm. they say. You know, I'm one of you guys, and I hate this person too. And it's like blah blah blah. And it's like, dude, like, take a look at yourself. If you want to right. make a difference, look at yourself. Right. Fix yourself first. You know, because oh, another example. I remember Jamie Foxx told that really bad Caitlyn Jenner joke, and he made it. And everybody's like, you're a transphobic piece of crap. Blah blah blah. And, you know, yeah, sure, people had a right to be a little upset, but at the same time, I'm like, 10 years ago, you could tell a trans joke and everybody would have laughed. Well, and, 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 like, now we realize, like, hey, that's not cool. And, you know, when you look at the way we talked in the 90s, it was very homophobic. L- listen, listen to a rap song from 91. You listen, it was very homophobic. Yeah. The culture said it was okay to talk and use those words. Unless you're big, because he'd suck your daddy's dick. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> dude, you spent the lyrics at me. But, th- but think about that. But think about that, dude. It's like, you know, society is changing. And if you're a good person, you understand, like, okay, this is how I have to be now. And you know what? I think it is fair to people, and I'm going to make that change. But don't jump back to when society was teaching us the wrong things and right. go, you were a bad person back then. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. You, you shouldn't have said that, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It's like, you have because to it, Because it's wrong now. I, you, like, the same society that's judging people is the same society that taught people to say that Absolutely. crap back then. Absolutely. That's why, like, I don't even bother talking to people over the age of 65 about race, <laughs> race issues, right. especially. Right. Because, like... You grew up in a culture where it was taught, it was taught, and you were ingrained yeah. to not like other people based off what they look right. like and how they act. Like, uh, like, definitely not okay now. But I'm not going to change what has been ingrained in you because right. y- this is what you know and believe to be right. Like you even know? like even when it comes to race issues, like if I heard a video recording, let's say, dude, let's say something crazy. Let's say somebody who I, like somebody who's like seventy. Let's say Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now this is not true, but let's say. There was some Arnold Schwarzenegger was caught saying some crazy racist stuff back in 1960 or whatever. Right, smoking weed, lifting weights, right, and dropping and, and drop the end bomb or yeah. something like that. Honestly, I'm not gonna hate him for that. No, because the culture back then said it was cool. If he said it now, I'm like Arnold, you know how that makes people feel. You well, can't say that now. Well, and you know what? And and e- even if the culture didn't think it was cool. That's fucking 50 years ago. It is. People change. Dude, we're right. just talking about how much we changed in a year. Yeah. Like, if, if, if. There's a huge difference between what you say and what you stood for and what you do. Right. I've always, I always like to believe I was always a good person and I did the right things. I know I never always said the right things. Right. And that wasn't intentionally to hurt people. And that's anybody. If right. you're listening to this, you have told a race joke. You have told a sex joke. You have told, you have said something. You have whispered something that could have been hurtful to somebody else. It doesn't make you a bad person. No. It just makes you human. I don't want you, I want you to be a decent enough human being to know and recognize I can't say these things to somebody because I could really hurt somebody. Right. But I don't think you should be judged and condemned because you had a moment of ignorance that you had to learn from. Right. Everybody has a moment of ignorance they have to learn from. Right. You don't just wake up and have it all together. Every single person you meet has stumbled, uh, did bad thing. I mean, hell, we, we live in a side where we can, you know, a, a person who used to do drugs can be a superhero. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's not, yeah. and that's awesome. I love, that's the society I want. I want the society of forgiveness and education and learning and growth. Do you, remember, do you remember Felony Bay? I don't remember Felony Bay. So it was this guy who had his, mixed dude had his mugshot released online. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That guy, that guy. Now he's a millionaire. Yeah, he's, he's a millionaire. A he's, he's a, a professional model. 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 And, you know what? and you know what? For me, I want everybody to have opportunity. Yeah. I, think, I think that's why there's so much anxiety and depression right now. Because these kids nowadays feel like I have to get everything right. Because if I don't get everything right, that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. We didn't have to grow up with that, but yeah. they do now. And that's... Bullshit. Because it's instant gratification. No girl, no, no girl should have to feel like she can never get married because somebody got a picture of her with some guy, you know, back in high school or some crap like that, and she shouldn't be condemned for that. Right. No guy should feel like he should never be able to get a job because in high school he wore the wrong kind of t-shirt. If you can grow up, learn from mistakes, and love yourself and set out to do good to other people, I don't give a shit what you did for twenty years ago. Right here and now, we're in right. this fight together. It's completely different. Right, it's and, completely and, but, different. and but people are gonna be upset and they're gonna, you know. And I was like, what do you want? 
Right. Like the same thing happened with Trevor Nova. He told Joe, he's like, no, I'm not gonna apologize for a joke I told ten freaking years ago. Absolutely. Like, what are you gonna get out of that? Yeah. What are you gonna get out of that? It, it, that instant gratification. That instant gratification of, of knowing of knowing that you won, whether it's a minor yes. or a major battle. Yes. And people want to know, I got this trophy. This trophy's in my case. That is the best way to put it, man. And, and that instant gratification is not worth it. You have to start being mature and thinking long term and long game. We're not talking. We want people to get away with crimes. You know, we're talking. We're but talking. I want you to be able to, you know, redeem yourself from the crime. That yes. You committed. Yes. If you generally want to redeem yourself, you're you're, you're going to be able to do that. And most people have redeemed themselves. Yeah. You know, like I said, it's, it's just bullshit that people are just getting crucified for crap that that had no harm or effect on anybody. But right then and there, it's getting discovered. And now it's like, oh, you're a bad person because you said it's some dumb crap. <laughs> 25 years 25 ago. 25 years ago. And, and if I recorded every message everybody on this block that I live said, I could, it, oh, dude, it's just, I can't judge people. I exactly. cannot judge people. I cannot, I cannot judge people. If you're trying to do better now, we can work something out, right. but it, it, I do. I what, yeah. do, what right. do you want from that? It, right. this if, if, you acknowledge, if you acknowledge this, and now you're trying to change it, right. then we're good. But we're then all, we're good. We're good. You hear stories about clansmen who are now like on the front lines, for, you know, fighting for, fighting for, for, fight for other people because they grew up in a culture where you know, hey, um, you uh, have to be this. Uh, American history X could not have happened in 2018. Oh, absolutely. People have been like, he's a Nazi. He doesn't have his story told. And it's like, if this dude is setting out to set things right and tell his story and can encourage people not to join other Nazis despite his background, all that shit, mm -hmm. tell that freaking story. Yeah. That, think about that for a second. Absolutely. You know how many people who wouldn't be allowed to speak now, even though it's for the greater cause, for the greater good, for unity, for the things that we are fighting for, yeah. but they wouldn't be able to speak because they weren't perfect. And nobody is perfect. Right. Nobody's perfect. Ever. 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 Except, Ever. Online. Except, Except online. online. Except online. Except online. Except online. Yeah. Oh my God! And that's, just, and that and that's and I think that's another. We're, like I said, we, I know we keep harping on this, but you know the instant fucking gratification. Yeah. Like people think, okay, I did this for ten minutes. Well, now why am I not being rewarded? Right. You know. No. That little tiny hit of dopamine is nothing compared to. It's not working for a year and a half, and you know breaking your back to finally get shit to fucking be done, and then now somebody says thank you. Right. Just a small thank you for something that you fucking worked on for you know a year and a half, like, two years, dude. Like, I, like I said, this the past year and a half, I've been planting seeds, and now I'm seeing stuff starting to grow, yeah. and it's like that's rewarding, and I know that's gonna be here for a long time. Um, there was like a cool sermon, it says something like, "What you seek will be a reward. If your reward is gratification from people, then you might get it. You know what I'm saying? And that, but that's gonna be the top level of it. But if you seek for something deeper, like purpose and all that stuff, mm -hmm. it is gonna be a bigger reward." So a lot of people seeking instant gratification, they're going to get that, but they're not going to be satisfied afterwards. Right. Versus people. Because now it's what's next. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. So if you seek a deeper meaning, something that's more in tune with your legacy and stuff like that, you're going to have more uh, lasting purpose and happiness and fulfillment. You know? Yeah. And, and, and this is something else I, you know, I talk about, too. It's just, you know, I, I, I feel like I talk about this a lot, but just changing the way you think about things like that. Yes, like, definitely. Um, and I, and I, I spoke about this on uh, other podcasts recently, but it's so say you want to fucking you're out of shape and you're 250 pounds overweight and you're going to the gym twice a week and your only thought is I don't want to be fat. Yeah, it, that's, that's not going to work. That's not the, that's not that's the, not going to work. Your, your, your thought has to be. I want to be healthy. Yeah. I'm going to be the best version of me I can be. I want to be able to play with my kids. Yes. I want to be here as long as I can. For, yes. You have to have a deeper meaning and root. Because honestly, you're going to wake up one day. You're going to be tired. You're going to be like, you know what? I'm already fat. I've lived in this body. I'm comfortable with it. And that's cool if you, if, if you can live with that. But if you're generally trying to get back in shape for deeper meaning, right. then you have to other find than it. Other I than, I, be fat. other than I want to look good when I take pictures on the internet, yeah. you know, it, it has to be deeper than that. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And if you, if you want to love the skin you're in, go for that. There's, you know, I know a lot of beautiful big women. <laughs> right. Right. You know, and I like them because they're so confident and they're so beautiful and they love themselves and they're not doing crap for their Instagram. You know what I'm saying? It, but I know you were just using that example. But like you said, if you can find your deeper meaning, I'm more attracted to people who have deeper meaning. Yeah. You know, like, I, like, you're, like my mindset of the type of girls you want to date at 22 versus the type of woman you want to date at 32 is right. so different, man. Right. Like, you know, you know, back in the day, it's always the pretty girls who wore the height, all this and that. And now I look at a woman and she's like, she's like doing volunteer work. And I'm like, oh, marry me. 
Uh, you, see, you see how her hair just fell out of the uh, ponytail when she been down like, there? Like, oh man, her hair. Oh my gosh, she's doing about to work. She's wiping sweat off her brow. She got dirt on her hair. All right, she's, you know? she's, all right, all right, she's building a, you know, she's building stuff herself. in the inner city. Right, herself. she's building herself. Like, that is more attractive to me versus the girls who just want to be pretty and post memes about why relationships just are. Right, why, why men are dogs and women shit. Right. Like, well, you put your butthole on Instagram too. Oh, you dude, do it, no, so. no, no, no. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. It's but guys do, it, guys do it too, though, man. Like, you know, having a nice car and flashing that doesn't make you a complete person as well, so. No, because you're, you're, you're trying to complete, complete the image as opposed yes, to you're trying the, the inside. Yes, because the image is, you know, that's temporary, dude. You right. know? If, you, if, you, if you paint your house and your foundation shit, what's the matter? Exactly, dude. It, boom, nailed it. You know, you know, we're all going to get older, and that's nothing wrong with that. So when we get old, we got to have more to offer than just youth because right. we're not going to keep that <laughs> we're not right your, your, your tits ain't going to be in the same spot oh just <laughs> oh you gotta cut that out man you edit that out <laughs> no, no, no we're unfiltered here we're unfiltered. oh man oh man uh, the only thing i might cut out is uh a few minutes a few seconds of dead air at the very beginning yeah that's about it oh man I don't know. and i feel like i feel like um i feel like that's the only way to do podcasts yeah you know that's true. like i've i've had opportunities to you know Talk to people on the phone yeah. and record that way. I can't do that. Yeah. Like sitting here like this, looking in your eyes, yeah. like feeling your actual energy, like we were talking about earlier. Like right. you can't just fucking have a real conversation with somebody over the phone. It feels yeah, it feels too structured. Like, right. If I call you on the phone and you have to switch over your laundry and you're about to walk out of the door, I feel how you, much right. of the shit are you gonna listen to? Uh, you know what I'm right. saying? I feel you. Know? you. I feel so, you. Yeah, I, I I really enjoy the fucking personal sit down shit I fucking enjoy you sitting down with me today man. dude I enjoyed this this was this was very cool talk man yeah, I was worried it's gonna be a lot of dead air like nope <laughs> you got too much to catch up on too much to catch up on yeah. anything else man for real um, what else you got bro anything you want to plug anything you want to talk about um, anything you want people to be looking out for uh yeah, just be look out for uh, Vincent's Val. Uh, that's from Do More Films. It's going to come out. Uh, well, I don't know when it's going to come out, but we're shooting at Springfield right now. Uh, Circa 87, that's who's doing Smile. That's the main film I'm starring in. Uh, that's Lee the Rowe. production company? That's Circa 87. Yeah, check their website out. They've done a lot of cool stuff for the Midwest. Uh, I want to give a shout out to all my friends at Creative Actors. I want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Built by Battle. They're actually just really cool t shirt company. Uh, they basically just take people from all walks of life, you know, fighters, uh, servicemen, stuff like that, and they just kind of have this cool mantra, just, hey, we're all built by battle in life, so get, shout out to Danny Smith if you're hearing this, buddy. Uh, but yeah, man, I'm just very thankful for the way things are going, uh, and just not, I'm no longer afraid of the next step. It's like, when you look at how far you've come, it's like, what can take me down? You know what I'm saying? Right, we, We've all survived a lot, and we're all made it further than we thought we would, and don't be so scared to take that next leap, and the next couple, you know, it's going to be a lot of leaps, man. And, and, and that's and that's kind of where I get, you know, the, the name of this podcast. Um, why not? Right. Why not you? Why not? Why, why not? Why can't you do this? Yeah. So if one last piece of advice you have for anybody out there who's struggling with that question, why not? Why, why can't it be me? You are stronger than you think you are, man. You, everybody is stronger than they think they are. Uh, take, take, take a pen and paper and write a date down. And then tell yourself, by this date, I'm going to have this thing done. Because a lot of people aren't, they're not hitting their goals because they're kind of keep them hidden, and, hidden away. But you write some shit down, and now it's right in your face. Put it into existence. You put it into existence. Just by, and I tell you what, I made a list of 30, 30, 30. Okay, this is, this is it right here. 30, okay. 30, 30. All right, for you listening. 30 things you want to do, 30 things you want to be, and 30 things you want to have in life. Don't limit it. Just if you want to say, I want to go in space, hey, put that on the list, whatever. Don't limit it. And I want you to write those 30 things now. 30 things you want to be, 30 things you want to do, and 30 things you want to have. It could be anything, anything, all right? And you may not be able to fill that whole list out right away. And it might be a week or two. And you get that list, you look at it, and you'll see a lot of common things in there. And you'll see who you type of person you are. And then you'll start one by one, just checking things off on that list, checking things off on that list. Uh, I wrote a lot of ridiculous stuff on my 30-30. Like, one of the things I wanted to be was a superhero. You know, I wanted to be a teacher, actor, all that stuff. Uh, and you find that life somehow finds a way, man. Like, the superhero thing. I'm like, how the hell am I going to be a superhero? And I wrote this list about a year and a half ago. Be your own superhero. Be your own superhero. But the other cool thing is I had this Captain America suit, and I got it for Halloween. But now I'm like, okay... I can't just have this suit and shield just chilling in my place. So now I contacted like a children's hospital. 
So now I'm, they want, now I can do some volunteer work as a super. So I'm actually going to be Hell a super. Yeah. So Hell that's yeah. how life, super that is too. how life works, man. So make that list, keep that list close to you. And as you cross things off that list, add something on. So now you have goals in life and now you're driven to get things knocked out. And those are the things you really want to be. And as you start accomplishing those things that you write down, no matter how big or small, you can start small and then work your way up to the bigger stuff. You will actually start feeling more purpose driven and feeling like, okay, I am becoming the person I want to be. And I can honestly say I am the person I want to be like a year ago, two years ago. I couldn't confidently say that, but now I'm like, wow, I really am the type of person I want to be. I've always wanted to do a podcast. That's on my list, so thank yeah, you. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> so life, life finds a way, man. And like, like people attract like people. Right. Too. You know what I'm saying? So when people see you doing your thing and the vibes and all that, it, you're going to just attract all kinds of people. Like, it's only attracting magnets. It really do, man. They really freaking do. That's, that's, that's the way I think about I've probably met more like-minded people in like the past couple months than I have in years man you know I, I give credit like years actually I met like last year like I said when I joined my acting class when, when you went full time doing exactly what you yeah when I went full time and the thing is it's not easy like I'm I'm doing this during the day and I'm also doing my job at night so basically career during the day job right. at night you know and I do manage to get rest you know I, I sleep six seven hours or I take naps or whatever it's going to be a grind, but at the end of the day, to stop my career during the day doesn't feel like, right. doesn't feel like work. No. It, it keeps me sound, man. Because why, sound. why spend 50 hours a week building somebody else's dream? Exactly, man. I'm, like, I'm using the resources from the work I do, and I do my work well, so that I had the resources to build my dream. So it's a perfect balance. So I, when I go into work, I'm not this miserable person because I'm thankful. I'm like, you guys are helping me do what I want to do. Right. And that's what your work should be. You guys do. are a stepping stone to what yes, you need to be. Yes, your work should be able to do what you want to do. You know, I don't think any company is going to say, well, you have ambition. We don't want you to do right. things you want to do for your life. You know what I'm saying? Your work, your job, if it's not what you want to do, that's basically just to help you save up, get your resources, get your life together, and then you continue on. If I had a company, that's what I would want. I would want people to come in, work hard, do the job I need them to do, and then one day they'd be like, thank you for this opportunity. It's helped me so much get my life together. Now I got to go my own way. And I would not be upset at that. Because right. that's the process, man. Right. That is, that's the part. That's of, the fruits of your labor. That's the fruits of your labor, man. Yeah. And then somebody else with the same ambition comes in. They do the, the, whole, the whole cycle can continue that right. way. You know what I'm saying? So, right, because you know, you've, you've, you've built that person. Now they see yes. the model. And this person's like, okay, well, I worked here for 20 years. Now I'm going to go start my own company. Yeah, and, there's, and then there's that, that kid at home who's like, man, he worked there for 25 years. Right. And now he's got a company yeah. that's just as big. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, right. man. You know, you, you don't have to be somebody else's possession, you know? Absolutely. Well, let's end it on that. Yeah. Raymond, I love you, brother. Justin, love you too, so man. Much, you're a good dude, man. Thank you, Justin. Love you.